Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is September 10th, 2019. We are in the first 10 days of IC Awareness Month, and I thought I would do a drop-in support group meeting. Let's see how people are feeling today, if anybody's having flares today. How's life? All those good things, my friends. And so remember the purpose of our support group meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, and so informed that no one can ever mess with you again. You should not be, you should be able to defeat any argument from anybody who says that I see is all in your head because we certainly know that it's real. How do we know that it's real? For some patients, when we look in their bladders, we see visible ulcers and lesions. For other patients, there are other very clear pathological findings. So nobody should be telling you at this point in time that IC is all in your head. Hello, Shirley. Hello, Rebecca. Jamie. Yvette. Hi, Yvette. Hi, Casaray. Oh, man, girl, you're having a big flare today with a UTI. All right. Well, we will have to talk about that. So when I'm looking up, I'm looking at Facebook. When I'm looking down, I am looking at YouTube. Let me just try to set my computer up here real quick. Hold on a second. Y'all know I got a sunburn. Hello. I got a sunburn today. We lost a very, very beloved neighbor, uh, 97 years old, Leon, yesterday morning. And his wife has Alzheimer's. And I went down to talk to her this morning. And she wanted to sit in the full sun. And so I sat with her in the full sun for about 30 minutes. Hence, this lovely sunburn, which is going to be plain hell with me in a bit. All righty. Let's just let a few more people come in. Hello, YouTube. Nice to see you guys. Hi, Ravonda. Hi, Kim. Hi, Sherry. So uh, first things first, uh, uh, I, have, I have several things that I want to talk to, talk out to you about today, including one that's very, very frustrating. But before we do that, remember, hello, my friends, it is Icy Awareness Month. Did you know that you can win a $100 Amazon gift card if you enter a poster in our Icy Awareness Month contest? You could win a $100 gift card or a $50 gift card or $25 gift card if you enter our meme contest, which is hella fun because they're funny. They're supposed to be funny. The purpose of a meme is that you could share it through Facebook. And so it could be anything from, I've been posting some of them on our IC, uh, IC Network Facebook page. They can be really funny. They can be really serious. They can talk about, you know. Uh, some of uh, some of them are hysterically funny, and some of them chastise doctors, and some of them talk about the cost of medical care. But seriously, a hundred bucks, my friends! And so, what did I say when we kicked off IC Awareness Month? You know, I mean, normally at the end of every meeting, I say I need you to do fifteen minutes for your bladder. I need you to do fifteen minutes for to calm your spirit. I need you to do 15 minutes to work on your knowledge of IC, but I need you right now to do 15 minutes a day for IC Awareness Month. Um, because if not you, who? If not us, who else is going to do this? Nobody else is going to do this. There's no big pharmaceutical company behind this. There hasn't been big pharma behind IC Awareness activities in more than a decade. It really is a grassroots effort where you and I work together to uh, introduce some resources in your community. It's modeled after National Women's Health Week. So IC Awareness Month is not about me. It's not about promoting the IC network. It's not about promoting the ICA. It's about you looking at your community and going, are we serving patients good enough? And if you are not, what are you prepared to do about it? I happen to have, we happen to have over on icawareness.org, this fabulous press release. You can send to your local paper. You can go, you can do an event. You can send our posters. Look at this. We got some beautiful posters that you can download right now and, and give them to your doctor's office and put them up there. One of my big dreams was to have a poster on IC in every single urology clinic in the, in the United States and around the world. Um, and that's something I still talk to companies about trying to get somebody to sponsor it because it would probably be a $20,000 project. But anyway, we got a couple of posters that you can download right on our website. 
Uh, this is a good one. Do you have ICPPS? Are you living in your bathroom? Can't sleep through the night? Hell yeah. Do you have pain as your bladder fills with urine? Uh, hell yeah. Do you have pain before, during, or after intimacy? Uh, yeah, hell yeah. Does it feel like a urinary tract infection though no infection is found? Uh, hell yeah. You are not alone, my friends. And I promise you, one of the reasons we have to do this is because there are patients suffering right now at home who have no clue that there are treatments who have no clue the difference between bladder wall injury, chronic infection, pelvic floor injury, nerve injury. You know, I always tell patients, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. There is something going on your, in your pelvis that is triggering your symptoms. So what do we have to look at? We have to look at bony structures. You have to look at organs, your bladder, your, uh, your urethra, not technically, is it? A, it's a urethra and organ. Well, it's part of the organ system, part of the urinary tract system. We got to look at the reproductive system. We got to look at the muscles, see if there's anything funky going on with the muscles. And we have to look at the nerves. Is there anything funky going on with the nerves? Any and all of those things could contribute to the symptoms that you might be experiencing right now. You know, we are long past the day of thinking that IC is an incurable bladder disease. We don't do that anymore. It is more of a pelvic pain syndrome. And this is what the top IC doctors have been doing for a decade now, is they're trying to understand these unique variations of IC. Right? And, the, and how do you know that there's variants? All you got to do is ask your friends how their symptoms started. Because for some people, IC starts in childhood. For others, IC starts after menopause. Are they the same? Hell no. Should we be treating them the same? Hell no. For some people, IC starts after some sort of traumatic injury, like falling on your tailbone or riding a motorcycle for eight hours through the redwoods and getting up at getting off your bike at the other end and going, oh, holy hell, what is wrong with my bladder? I got to pee all the time. True story. Or for others, IC begins after having a baby. For some, IC begins after chemotherapy. For others, IC can begin or can be, can be triggered by a horrendously bad diet. I mean, you gotta understand right now, the human body was not designed uh, 5, 10, 15,000 years ago with coffee in mind and with soda in mind. For, and for those of you who are drinking lots of coffee and soda, that takes a toll on those tissues, especially as you get older. And of course, one of the things I'm going to be writing a really big article on the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, because that's, uh, in fact, there's a big awareness campaign happening in Europe right now, which is so freaking good about menopause and the importance of menopause and how that affects a, a woman's body and how that affects our bladder and how that affects our urinary tract. So we are subtyping. We are subtyping. We are trying to understand your unique presentation of IC because a one treatment fits all approach simply does not work. It does not work. Now I want to talk to you about something though. On um, let me get this here for a moment. So over the weekend, and sorry, I got I got like all sorts of things making noise right here. Hold on. Let me move that. That's my fluid stance, which I will probably be switching to. For those of you who know, I have an SI joint pelvic floor dysfunction and sitting is challenging for me. So I'm on a stool right now, leaning forward. So, you know, um, Over the weekend, there was a really, really um, stressful discussion of IC over on Twitter. And it was led by Dr. James Maloney and his uh, colleagues and friends from other countries who believe that IC is the result of chronic bladder wall infection. And if you look at the subtyping system, so we've got Hunter's lesions, bladder wall driven, pelvic floor driven, ner um, pudendal neuralgia, and central sensitization. Those are our five core subtypes. So in subtype number two, we have bladder wall. 
And in bladder wall, in that variant, there are different things that can irritate, damage, and cause the bladder wall to be dysfunctional. Menopause is an example of one. Chemotherapy is an example of one. And chronic infection absolutely has a place. Some people really do have chronic infection. Not everyone, but some of you do. Some of you could. In fact, uh, I just got an email last night from a young man whose symptoms started in high school when he had a wicked candida infection in his mouth. Okay, and so anyway, um, uh, Dr. Maloney is uh, one of those rare doctors who is fascinated by the urinary tract. He feels that it is underserved and he has dedicated his entire career to the understanding of cystitis. And for that, we owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude. And he is the one who has really kind of led the movement in helping us understand that typical urine tests simply are not accurate. And a uh, um, pH test strip or just test strip test for uh, leukocytes and nitrates, not particularly reliable. You know, and now we have next generation DNA testing, which can identify all of the living things in your bladder, whether it be bacteria or whether it be fungal or whether it be a viral. So, um, they were going, let me tell you, they, they gave me hell. <laughs> they gave me hell because they really believe that I see is all infection driven. And despite the fact that no major urology association in the world is willing to get on that bandwagon, um, the top upper echelon of IC, the European Society for the Study of IC and the American Urology Association have been instead focusing on subtyping. And, and that is ultimately as a support group leader, you, you know, guys, I, I have talked with thousands of patients in the last 25 years. You know, I averaged like four or five a day for 25 years. And when you spend time with patients and you hear those patient stories, it, it is crystal clear that there's tremendous diversity in this patient population. And for anybody to make blanket statements that everyone has this or everyone has that is, in my opinion, a mistake. Because for every patient out there who might think that they've got infection, I've got other patients who think that they've got pelvic floor muscle injury with the proof to back it up. And so there's no right answer here. There's no right answer here. We cannot say blank statements about this patient statement, except for the fact that many of you have terrible pain. And so um, anyway, you know, I've gone through this for the last 25 years, right? I mean, we've had waves of kind of uh, different theories, whether it's Lyme disease, whether it's Dr. Fukuzato, whether it's, you know, fungal infection, whether it's the anti-proliferative factor. I mean, this is one of the things that, you know, it's just something that, that I have kind of lived through. But ultimately, in the end, the, the question is, is who's right? Who's right? And I, I want to bring up a, a, a researcher activist that I have known for 20 plus years. Her name is Barbara Flanagan. Barbara Flanagan was the original founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Association. I know some of you think that it was Vicki Ratner. It wasn't. The original ICA was started by Barbara Flanagan and two other patients of Lowell Parsons here in California in San Diego. And then the other ICA came about about a year later. And that was the one that uh, Vicki ran around. Okay. But there were, so there were two ICAs. The first ICA was extremely focused on research. But, you know, patient support was secondary. They wanted to get to the root problem of IC. What is the freaking root problem in some patients? And Barbara Flanagan, for the last 30 years, is an example of someone who 
rather than getting online and yelling at people and, you know, with personal attacks and stuff like that, man, she is just behind the scenes writing researcher after researcher after researcher in the National Institutes of Health and other groups. And she's focusing on science. So I got, and I highlighted her in our magazine two years ago because the first ICA believed early, early on that for some patients, IC was a variant of a medical condition called porphyria. P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-I-A, porphyria. And porphyria is all about vitamin B12 processing. And um, they had early research that they presented. We're talking back in the late 1980s, early 1990s with the National Institutes of Health and the porphyria researchers. And then it got tanked for a while. And then, and then she was, she was uh, uh, persistent and she brought it back. And I got just yet, you know, I get these big kits of information from her. Um, and she keeps saying to me, Jill, Jill, this is the answer for some patients. Some patients have a B12 processing problem. So again, so, so think about my weekend here for a moment. I had people telling me that every IC patient had, or almost 90% of IC patients had chronic infection. But then I've got this other group of patients who say, no, it's porphyria. It's a vitamin B12 processing. Okay, not an uncomfortable, this is not a comfortable position for me to be in because I can't make everybody happy. All I can do is talk about it with you, right? And tell you that absolutes do not work. We cannot, we don't, We cannot say conclusively that everybody has the same thing. Because again, look at the childhood onset of IC versus the menopause onset of IC. Completely different. Look at the person who developed IC after having a baby. Look at the guy who developed IC after a long motorcycle ride or a paratrooper who took a bad fall jumping out of an airplane. There is, it is very, very clear that there are distinct variants in this patient population. Now, the challenge with the uh, porphyria theory is that, in all honesty, it is so academically advanced. And I've got a degree in pharmacology. You know, I've got two degrees in chemistry. Even I have, tr- I have trouble understanding it. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily want to get into it, but I do want to read... Um, the first paragraph of the letter I just got from her. And this is a, um, a graphic that she sent to me. And it's transcobobulin 2 deficiency, the common cause of porphyria, interstitial cystitis, IBS, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and more. And it's the failure to understand the limitations of the standard B12, B12 test has kept us sick does not measure B12 in tissues, and in particular, not in liver tissue. One can have a B12 deficiency in the liver while standard B12 testing remains normal. And then she gives the whole pathway, as you can see, the hepatokine pathway. It is incredibly complex. So she says, Dear Jill, I want to thank you for giving giving me a platform for disseminating information on where our IC research took a wrong turn. But I also want to make sure that you understand the science of acute porphyria. The science here is a, is more than a bit confusing because there are two entirely different disorders of the same hepatokine pathway. Both are called porphyria. The first has to do with skin lesions. We, we do not have this, although I do. It is, it is a different disease entirely. The only type of porphyria that we IC patients are dealing with is called acute porphyria. All of the symptoms here are of neurologic origin, and these symptoms tend to be highly diverse, but the most common manifestation of symptoms are IBS, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and IC. Um, And anyway, um, let's see. It is well known that porphyria and and IC have identical bladder symptoms. Some of our doctors actually tested for porphyria, but the results were negative. 
But what we could not have known was that the porphyria enzyme theory was just a theory. It was never conclusively proven, as Gulf War syndrome researchers pointed out. Uh, and anyway, so who's right? Who's right? And, and, and the answer goes back to subtyping. Do I think that a, a population of IC patients have chronic infection? Oh, hell yes, I do. Not all of you, but some of you. A small group of you probably do. Do I think that some people have a severe vitamin B12 deficiency? Yeah, I do. I have low B12, a very low B12. And so the exciting part of this is that the research is happening. The research is dynamic. We're making more sense. Here she is. Look at this. This is what she sent me. Jill, this short little paper is a smoking gun. Hereditary partial transcobobulin to deficiency with neurologic, mental, and hematologic abnormal abnormalities in children and adults. Uh, please run right out and get twisted for B12. <laughs> I've been getting these for 20 years from her. And here's another one. Uh, the nature of neuropathy complicating acute intermittent porphyria. And she says, this is worth a Nobel Prize. So this is what I want to I want to say to the people who were attacking uh, me over the weekend and trying to make me say that everybody that the IC network had failed because we weren't telling everybody they had infection. Um, blanket statements don't work. And if you, if you went to a support group meeting and you met a group of patients, you would see that quickly. If you go to any support group on Facebook and you ask, when did your symptoms start? How did they start? You would see that quickly. What? But if you have a passion about something, if you have a strong belief about something, if you feel the research community has missed something, don't scream about it on Twitter or Facebook. Do what Barbara's doing. Make your case. Print out some articles. Write a letter to all of the top IC researchers. You can do that. You can do that. We have their addresses on our website. If you feel that something has been missed, this is the perfect time for you to set pen to paper or, or fingers to a keyboard in the middle of the night when you are up all night crying because you're hurting. If you think we're all missing something, make a case and send it off. Or if let's say you send letters out, like Barbara, Barbara sent a ton of letters out in 20 years. I don't know how many's responded, maybe 25%, but the 25% are top porphyria researchers in the country. I mean, she's on to something. Um, be persistent, be vocal, but don't yell at me. Go to the top doctors, go to the top doctors. You can go, if you are in Europe, you can go to the European Society for the Study of IC annual meeting, which is coming up this fall. If they don't support your theory, if you want to know why they don't support bacteria as a cause of IC, you can ask them publicly in front of all the top IC Europe researchers in Europe. Be bold, my friends, and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. But it's not helpful to be on the internet and yell at people. If you think you got a theory, if you got a question, you know, I remember, <laughs> you know, I got to say this, when I, after grad school and I left pharmacology because of the animal research, I, I went to work for uh, the federal government for a year before I went back to grad school. And I got into trouble because I called people. I didn't just, I mean, like, seriously, I'm going to call people. If I don't have an answer, I'm calling somebody. And I remember my success rate, my caseload was really high because I called people until my boss figured out I was calling people and yelled at me. And then I called, I accidentally called a top secret line. And the person who answered the phone said, who are you and where are you working? 
I made the wrong phone call in the feds at that point in time. But I brought that philosophy to IC. When I started the IC network, I called researchers. I sent them emails. What can I do to help you? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Is there anything that we can do together? But seriously, if I can do it, you can do it. You can do it. But don't bitch on the internet about it. Do it. Look at this. Again, I want to point this out. This is a small letter. Her packets are huge. This is what she wrote. I mean, this is what she wrote explaining her theory. These were the articles backing it up, and she's sending it to everybody she can. National Institutes of Health on down, saying, hey, what do you think of this theory? Can we research this a little bit more? Can we rule this out or rule this in? Okay, so, you know, at one point in time over the weekend, I just said, guys, seriously, you know, debate the message, not the moral character of the people who might have a different opinion than you. And that's the ultimate failing of the Internet, and social networking and IC groups is seriously all attack each other. Don't attack each other. Debate the issue. Just debate the issue. Do you have a test that supports that? Where can I get the test? Where can I learn more about it? But enough of this. You know, listen, Facebook, I'm, Facebook, I'm talking to you. You guys got some work to do to make this a really supportive platform. I will never forget the guy who was kicked out of a support group because a support group leader said, guys didn't get IC. Not true. Imagine how he felt. Not true. So kindness matters. Kindness matters. Debate the issue, not the moral character. Have good, solid discussions. And if you think you're onto something, let somebody know. I double dog dare you to write, write a top doctor. I mean, I double dog dare you to write a top doctor. Why not? Why not? You got nothing to lose. Be bold. Go for it. All righty. Um, what else did I have? I mean, that was like the thing that was just kind of nagging me right now. So let's come, let's go and take some questions from you guys. Um, 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 and I, number one, I really, really hope that you're having a great day. But for those of you who aren't, tell us what's going on. So Rebecca asks, is aloe gel good for the bladder? Uh, an aloe gel, a topical aloe gel, can, you cannot get it into your bladder. You could take an oral desert harvest aloe and, and that might be helpful. Uh, desert harvest is the first company that did a double blind placebo controlled study with their product and IC, and it was found to be successful, but it was a small population. I don't remember how many patients were in the study. I'm going to say eight, nine, 10, somewhere in there. But that said, they're the only supplement companies actually put their money where their mouth is and they've actually studied it. And so at Desert Harvest Aloe is something that you could try. This is the uh, new bottle. They have a new design for their products. Um, uh, you just have to understand that some people are aloe intolerant. And so some of you, uh, when you take aloe, you get gut, gut issues and it's not the medication for you. I would also really encourage you to be very, very careful with um, um, uh, kind of drinks other than, I think I think it's Michael's, is, uh, there's, there's one drink company that makes a really high product, but actually in my original support group in 1993, I had a lady who'd been traveling to Asia and drank an aloe drink and, and she had a chemical injury from it. So the source matters. Dominica says, I belong to a pernicious anemia autoimmune gastritis Facebook group. I noticed a lot of people are complaining about bladder symptoms. Any research out there on the connection between B12 deficiency and the bladder? Yes, uh, Dominica, um, Barbara Flanagan is doing that. Other researchers are doing that. Porphyria researchers are doing that. And in our own research study, uh, we did a big research study on IC and stomach issues. 95% of patients in our survey reported episodes of gastritis, um, uh, GERD, gastroparesis at, with stomach issues. Um, but again, that was a voluntary study and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, you can't make any claim about 
percentages in the industry. I can just tell you that a number of patients said that they've had gastritis. I had I had gastritis before they diagnosed me with gastroparesis. Hello, Michelle from New Jersey. Nice to see you. Guys, remember, Facebook will not let me scroll up half of the time. And so uh, I am already missing things. So please ask your questions again. Rebecca says, how do I get a doctor who will look at these things? Well, Rebecca, on our website, we have an article on the subtypes of IC with a link to the journal article done by Dr. Christopher Payne. A lot of doctors don't want to read stuff that you get on the internet, and that's fine. Some do. I had a great conversation with a doctor. I have a new doctor, a new doctor in, in the Atlanta area. Area Boy, we had a wonderful conversation on Friday that I'll be referring patients to. Um, but some doctors don't want to do it. And so in that case, you really what you would want to do is try to print out the journal article. Uh, when he sees it in a medical journal, in a peer-reviewed medical journal, it will make a little bit more sense. And with respect to the B12, like I just asked my primary care provider to uh, do a whole new round of blood tests for me because I was very curious to see where my vitamin levels were. And uh, everything came back normal. And um, because I take B12 almost every day, uh, my B12 level looked okay. Ginny, Ginny says, yes, I got IC after my fourth baby. And so Ginny, for you, there's a very good chance that you are more the IC subtype three pelvic floor injury patient as compared to the Hunter's lesion patient. Angelique, now Angelique asks a really good question. She said, I had my bladder enlarged at the age of four. Could it have been IC or the cause of IC? So, Angelique, do you have any idea as to why that happened? Did you have an abnormally small bladder when you were born, or did they think something had happened? Um, but the reality is, is how did they enlarge it? That's the mystery here. Did they use a little bit of bowel tissue to enlarge your bladder? If that's the case, we know that bowel tissue exposed to urine over time, especially on icy urine, could uh, become incredibly inflamed and irritated. I'd love to hear more about your story, Angelique. Hello, Julie West. Um, um, Cesare, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I apologize. So she lost a kidney due to chronic kidney infections. Um, 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 hey, over my Twitter page, by the way, I, um, I put two new, uh, my Twitter is twitter.com forward slash ICN Jill. Uh, and I just put links to two fascinating new articles. One, uh, it was in, um, uh, where is it? In the Atlantic magazine. And it was about a woman who for 48 years was getting recurring bladder infections for 48 years. Her blood, it was, um, her infections are now resistant to nearly every antibiotic. And so she was very lucky to attract a top researcher who then followed her case closely for five years and did a massive amount of testing. And they were doing next generation testing. And the question is, you know, why did her bladder consistently have, and I forget the name of the bacteria, let me look. Very, very interesting case. Uh, a Nanel man began getting UTIs at 1971 when she got a hysterectomy following the birth of her sixth child. Uh, sixth child. She would take antibiotics, get better, get sick again, take antibiotics, get better, take other antibiotics, re repeat, repeat, repeat for more than 40 years. Um, and she is, of course, part of a growing and worrying trend. More and more UTIs are becoming resistant to infections. So she started working with a microbiologist at the University of Utah. And um, he did a multi-year study. And, and what they found was her infection was always exactly the same infection. It was an E. coli called ST131. 
and she was getting the same infection over and over and over again. So what they decided to do was sequence her, her bowel, her fecal tissue. And what they found was that the drug resistant infection in her bladder was hiding in her gut. And so, so they're of the position that for people who get recurring infections, the link is actually in uh, a dysfunctional uh, a bowel biome. And they are now studying fecal transplants as a way to treat urinary tract infections. Oh, that was weird. That was weird. Okay, sorry, that was my phone. All right. So here we have a research team who led a small clinical study on fecal transplants for patients with recurring UTI. And what they found is that three months, 10 patients uh, found that their UTIs were reduced, but they were no silver bullet. They, the effects wore off at six months, suggesting the gut microbiome might need to be replenished regularly. Boy, is there not yet a, another reason why we can't make blank statements? Because if, if that's true, could the bowel be harboring some of these pathogens that keep infecting some people? Which kind of throws salt water on th this other approach. Anyway, okay. Yvette Cap says, I think there's a strong link to infection. I, I agree with you. In some patients, there's a strong link to infection. There was also another study which found that, and I talked about that in the last meeting, that um, people who get a bladder infection and their body kills it quickly are not prone to recurring infection, whereas people who... Uh, do not get prompt treatment for that infection, that they believe that that creates a foundation where other infections, they would be more vulnerable to other infections. Ravonda says, what calcium supplement is okay for very sensitive bladders? You know, um, uh, calcium citrate, calcium carbonate are the, are the ones. You say you're only able to do about 10 foods, no dairy, no gluten, no oxalate, low oxalate, migraine, IC diet, no sugar. You know, you're just going to have to try, but, but whether it's the calcium citrate or the calcium carbonate, those are the ones that tend to be uh, most commonly used. I use calcium citrate myself and I don't take it near as much as I should. Carol says, hi, Emily. I heard that aloe vera can give you diarrhea. That is absolutely true. Some people are intolerant to aloe vera and it gives them gut issues. And if you're one of those people, you're not going to be able to take aloe. Yvette says she was just told she had a very low B12. Okay, so in, isn't that interesting, Yvette? So, Yvette, so now the question is, what does the doctor want you to, to treat it? My B12 was diagnosed as very low uh, five years ago. My D level was also very low, and they immediately put me on pretty major supplements to get it back up to normal. Ravonda says B12 flares you. Ravonda, I don't know why B12 would flare you because there's nothing in B12, the vitamin itself, that's usually bladder irritating. I would suspect that it would be an additive and it might be interesting to try different brands, but if not that, you're going to go to foods that are high in B12 instead. Google foods high in B12 and look for the ones that are IC friendly. Emily says she's heard the same thing about aloe vera causing gut issues, um, but that um, uh, desert harvest aloe has re removed that part of the plant. That's true, but there's still some people who are sensitive to it, even if that part is removed. I talk to them several times a week. Fiona says, do you think bladder installations help with chronic UTI infections by putting the coating on the bladder? Um, Yes, uh, by having, because when you have a, you know, normally that nice thick mucosal layer, a barrier in your bladder wall acts to repel bacteria. Um, and so if you're menopausal and you've got a thin bladder wall, having a coating in there might be an extra barrier for that. 
Uh, I will tell you Natural Approach Nutrition is working on two new supplements specifically targeted at infection. One is called um, uh, Biofilm Buster, something like that. And then the other one is called, let me look, the other one's going to be available first. It's really exciting. Um, uh, let's see, hold on. Let me get the name of the other one for you. So we should have that one in probably within a month or so. Pel let's see, is that it? No, no, no. It's called Prevent, P-R-V-N-T. It's a, they're calling it a superior UTI shield and it's got uh, uh, proanth proanthocyanidins, which is also found in Allura. It's got chondroitin for the bladder coating, some curcumin, some hyaluronic acid, some quercetin, and some, la uh, some lactobacillus in there. So the Prevent is, is pretty interesting. Dominica says, standard B12 uh, testing didn't pick up your pernicious anemia. Susie, Susie said, there are formulas of aloe vera that take out the ingredient that can cause the di diarrhea. Yeah, hon, I, Susie, you're right. You're right. The better companies will take that out. But you, it is an undeniable fact that some people are so sensitive, they just can't take it, even if that's been removed. Angelique says, I wish you would create a protocol of tests to go through to find and eliminate or possibly find cause. You know who's got a really, really good protocol is the European Society for the Study of IC. And... And it's on my list of things to do. My, my to-do list is so freaking big right now. It's ridiculous. I'm doing my best. Tammy says, thank you for what you do. I followed the Twitter feed and thought you handled yourself beautifully. Your professionalism, professionalism is top notch. It definitely is not a one size fits all. Thank you, Tammy. I was like literally in my car sitting outside Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Picking something up for my parents, trying to respond. But passion, you know, it's okay to be passionate. You just shouldn't attack people personally. Susie says, I constantly praise getting a chiropractor evaluation for IC. I completely agree with you, Susie, because that gets back to bony structures. Um, we told a really, really good story, patient story in our, our last magazine of an IC patient who had not responded to any bladder therapies. She was doing more research. She learned about pudendal neuralgia. She went and had an examination. And at that point in time, when they visualized her, her sacrum, what they found was that her sacrum was bent in the wrong direction. And, um, uh, and the, the, the doctor who found that was like, okay, that's odd but didn't do anything about it. She went to a chiropractor and it was the chiropractor who over a period of many months who was finally able to get her bony structures aligned again and was able to get that bend gone. And she is now, she's had a baby. She's gone from being in agony every day to being completely functional and, and a, a young mother. And so that is a case of a patient whose symptoms were driven by a bony abnormality. Hi, Rhonda Green, Greenway. Hello, Teresa. Hi, Sean. Has anybody tried colloidal silver? Sean, colloidal silver comes up in every meeting. I will tell you that colloidal silver uh, is not something that we support. Um, uh, it, it, I consider it a, um, uh, what's the right word? Oh, not old wives' tale. Um, it's a fad. It's a fad that goes through the IC community about once every five years. But what you do need to know is that the U.S. government issued a very severe warning about colloidal silver and its misuse, and they do believe it is one of the most dangerous over-the-counter supplements out there. Angelique says, hey, I'm aloe intolerant. Melody says, I suffer from gastroparesis. Melody, me too. <laughs> My gastroparesis hit about 10 years ago. And um, uh, it was hell. 
I'm not, I'm telling you, it was really hell. Oh, hey, hello. Do you have your IC Awareness t-shirt yet? <laughs> you can order those over on the IC Network website. Uh, guys, gastroparesis means you have delayed stomach emptying. And so food sits in your stomach for a long period of time and it starts to ferment. And as it ferments, it produces a, a massive amount of gas. And so people with gastroparesis, your food will sit in, stomach, in your stomach for hours and hours. Like I had, I ate breakfast of scrambled eggs at eight, eight or nine in the morning. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, when they did the endoscopy, my scrambled eggs were still in my stomach. Um, and, uh, and I was diagnosed with gastroparesis. I, I will tell you, Melody, I don't know about you, but boy, following the gastroparesis diet has almost eliminated my problem. Um, uh, because I have gastroparesis, I don't eat foods that are hard to digest. So I don't eat steak because that can sit in your stomach for a long period of time. And I personally don't eat leafy greens. Leafy greens are devastating to my gas. They're fine for my bladder, but when you got gastroparesis, leafy greens really produce a lot of gas. So I eat a ton of salad. I just don't eat lettuce. I eat peas and beets and carrots and garbanzo beans and you name it. I eat tons of salad. I just don't eat lettuce. My stomach is so much happier for it. Really interesting. Molly says, I used to tell my mom and dad that my blank was burning when I was a kid. The doctors thought it was for attention. It burned all the time. 13 years old when IBS was diagnosed. 16 when you were diagnosed with asthma. It is just weird now that I think about it. You may have had IC. So, so really what you had, I, I, have a th I, I mean, I have a theory on that. Uh, theory number one is that could you have had a pelvic floor injury? But that wouldn't correlate with uh, asthma and the IBS. Number two, could it be central sensitization, that inherited subtype? That's definitely a possibility. And, and number three, you know, could there have been some sort of early infection back then? I don't know. But, you know, my first symptom started in seventh grade, frequency urgency, couldn't sit through class. Nobody thought I was asking for attention, though. And that's, that's brutal to say that to a kid. Absolutely brutal. Yvette says, which supplement do you recommend for um, a B12? I, I just take a chewable B12. Uh, I've never flared. I've, I personally have never flared from it. I, I'll go get it for you. You can see it if you want. So this is the one that I use. It is, uh, it's just a, you know, it's just a chewable. All right. Fiona says, do you think bladder installations help chronic UTI infection? Oh, oh, I know. Yeah, we answered that one. Renee, going to a chiropractor for the first time tomorrow to hopefully relieve some IC symptoms. What type of question should I ask? So, so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing about a chiropractor is that they they can really rush to judgment, and you got to be really careful um, because um, uh, when you have a chiropractic evaluation, there's a lot of pushing and pulling and shoving. It's kind of I, I, whenever I had it done. Every time he made something pop, I just laughed out loud because it was so weird. So, so freaking weird. Um, what I would hope that you would do is explain that you've got pelvic pain, explain that it's affecting your bladder, and tell him you're tr that you're, you're on a quest to, to try to understand if your pelvic structures are normal, are they balanced? Um, and, and, you know, um, you know, I can't give you medical advice, son. I'm not a doctor. I can't give you medical advice. I'd really love for you to talk to your doctor about this, about what to look for and what not to look for. 
Um, some people love chiropractic care. Some people hate chiro chiropractic care. What I can tell you is chiropractic care involves some pretty heavy manipulation of your spine. And for some people, some people have been permanently damaged by really, really reckless chiropractors. So I, I would almost back off the first appointment completely and say, I want you to look at my body. I want you to look at how I'm looking, but I don't want you to do anything. Just mine them for information first. See what they think might be going on and then take that information to your regular doctor before you agree to therapy. Okay, that's kind of what I would do. I would hate for you to do something like um, there was a patient in Florida who, I don't know, this was some time ago, who went to a chiropractor and at the very first appointment, he did really deep abdominal pelvic floor massage. And it was agony for her agony. And I'll tell you, it took my physical therapist six months before he was willing to even go gently to work. You know, when, when I say this, remember, okay, so remember, you've got muscles that go from left to right, you've got muscles that go from front to back, and you've got muscles that go from low to high, right? Low to high. And with your hip bones right here, if you gently, gently push into your hip bone, if you feel pain there, that means that you've got a tight pelvic floor muscle. That's a pelvic floor trigger point. Gently, gently. So what this chiropractor did to her is he was not gentle. He was forceful, agonizing. and like she was at the emergency room, the pain was so bad. So again, Fiona, I mean, Renee, I don't think I would agree to any therapy if he tries to convince you otherwise, ask, ask him what he intends to do, ask him to describe it for you, ask him to demonstrate it, and... And of course, most importantly, ask him if he's ever worked with pelvic pain patients before. Let's see if he's got, he or she has experience first. Because if they've never worked with a pelvic pain patient before, I probably wouldn't even see them. I would look for somebody else. Okay. So you hear caution in my voice, extreme caution in my voice. Um, uh, I think I, I did it like four times and I just, for me, it wasn't meaningful. Uh, plus, the guy was a little creepy and wanted, me to, wanted to meet me in his office on a Saturday afternoon when nobody else was there. And I was like, hell no. I feel like I feel like we have to, you know, as a group, we all need to rehearse saying, hell no, no, you're not touching me. You know, no, 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 that is not OK. You may not do that to me. Why do you intend to do that? Tell me about it. Okay. Informed consent, my friends. Informed consent. You should. They should tell you what they're going to do before they do it, and you should consent to that treatment first, fully knowing the pros and cons, risks versus benefits. So sorry, said uh, she had her urethra dilated when she was seven or eight. Uh, girl, I had about 100 dilations between seventh and ninth grade. That's what they did back then. They don't do, do urethral dilations are really not done so much anymore. Uh, in fact, one doctor calls it raping the urethra. That was said at an American Urology Association meeting when an international doctor at, asked a leading American doctor if they still did dilations. And he said, hell no, we don't rape the urethra anymore. Direct quote from an IC session at the American Urology Association. Shirley says, has any other ladies gotten UTIs after their monthly periods? That's interesting. You know, um, Shirley, the thing that comes to mind with that would be you have to remember that blood is a wonderful medium for bacteria to grow in. And so if you are wearing pads and you're wearing a pad longer than two hours, you are potentially creating an environment for bacteria to grow. 
Um, and so if you're noticing now, I would certainly be using a peri, a peri bottle and rinsing yourself off every single time you use a restroom and changing those pads regularly. Remember too, that menstrual pads themselves are really well known to have caused some chemical irritation. So the question could also be, you think you have an infection, but is there any chance you having a chemical irritation, a chemical reaction instead? We really want to know if urinalysis test uh, or if anybody's actually ever found bacteria in those UTIs. Teresa said, I, I had a cystoscopy at 14, me too. But my current problems did not start until menopause. Okay, is there a possible connection? Were my bladder issues at 14 a possible predictor that I would have this later in life? Yes and no. I mean, the, so, or, so remember, Teresa, we have subtypes. We have variants, right? And we don't think of IC as a disease process. We think of it more as injury or trauma for many of us. So concept number one is you could have easily had some sort of pelvic injury when you were 14, like from riding a bike or falling down, and that may have healed. And now that you're menopausal, you're dealing with estrogen atrophy. That would be the most logical connection to me, especially if you haven't had any issues from 14 until menopause. Cesar, my constant infections were caused by pseudomonas that they track to your left kidney. Fascinating. Fascinating. Tracy says, what is the thought on cause for Hunter's lesions? I have that and I've never had a UTI. So Hunter's lesions are kind of uh, uh, one of what I would have said 10 years ago, one of the great mysteries of IC. But uh, researchers in Europe have made a couple of really important findings, and uh, they have tracked a couple of viruses to Hunter's lesions that they think that the Epstein-Barr virus, the polyoma BK virus may actually be playing a role in the development of that lesion. Um, and so the question is, have you ever had... Um, uh, mononucleosis. Uh, um, and it's interesting because the European Society for the Study of IC is so interesting because in their uh, patient workup to make a diagnosis, they, they apparently screen for viral infections. They say they do, but I reached out to them like two years ago and I said, so what do you do when you find a viral infection? And the answer was, was, well, nobody's really gone there. <laughs> we don't really know how to treat a viral infection. And then another doctor said, well, everybody knows there's viruses in the bladder. It's like, huh? Huh? Um, so I, that's something that I'm really, really interested in is uh, trying to understand more about the role, uh, any role that a, vir a virus or a vi viral infection could place in the bladder. But ultimately in the end, Tracy, here's what we know about lesions. They come and go. Some people can have lesions and then they completely disappear. Other people can start with one lesion and they end up with four or five. Um, the other thing we know is that when you treat a lesion correctly, the pain usually goes away. So if you do have a lesion, please come on over to our website, icnetwork.org and um, read the section on Hunter's lesions, which is what the American Urology Association says very specific way that hunter's lesions are treated. You either cauterize them, fulgurate them, which is with heat, laser them, which is also with heat, or you inject them with a steroid. Hunter's lesions do not respond to oral medications. If you have hunter's lesions also, it's very, very important that you follow diet because you have the equivalent of an open wound in your bladder. And I have pictures. Let me get out my slides here. Oh, 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 I have something else to talk to you too. Uh, we have a new Elmeron eye damage uh, study. It just came out a couple days ago. How did I for forget about that? Okay, so these are Hunter's lesions in 16 patients. So a Hunter's lesion is characterized by having a very large center point 
And when you buy, when that is biopsied, they find profound inflammation, profound inflammation. Um, and then you'll also notice that there tend to be red lines going away from the lesion. So what they do is they cauterize this lesion. We have a really good video on our website of a doctor actually doing that. And I think you would, it, you would find that very, very interesting to watch. As, as a, uh, compare that to this. This is more of a typical IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven. So IC subtype 1, Hunter's lesions. IC subtype 2, bladder wall driven. Not the same, right? Totally not the same. Very, very different manifestations. This is kind of the equivalent of, a, this is kind of what a skin knee would look like. You know, if you fall on skin your knee, you have a lot of little tiny spots on it. And that's kind of what the bladder looks like, a lot of little tiny spots. We call that petechial hemorrhaging or glomerulations. Molly says, I know we're not allowed to go near soy, but what about soy lecithin? It's a soy derivative. Uh, you know, you, you, we, you can't get away from all, all preservatives and all things like that. I mean, if it's a very, very small quantity, it's probably okay, but you won't know until you try it. Mary says, I have Hunter's ulcers. I also have Raynaud's and have an elevated ANA. What do you think about the possibility of some IC being autoimmune? Um, I, again, that's a subtype. That's definitely a subtype. There is an autoimmune variant in IC, but not everybody is autoimmune, but a small population of patients is probably, probably autoimmune. Susie is asking about cyanocobalamin uh, or methylcobalamin. I am so not the person to ask that question, but mine is the cyano. Uh, uh, you know who would have the perfect answer for that is the CEO of Natural Approach Nutrition. Tracy says, definitely started as pelvic floor dysfunction, but after three installations, your hunters got better. Are you afraid to keep going on the installs? Well, Tracy, you know, an installation ultimately in the end is temporary. It's, it's, it's designed to reduce symptoms, um, but it, it's not necessarily solving the physiological issue. And so um, I would, if I were you, uh, look at the American Urology Association guidelines for IC, which you can find on our website at their section on hunters, how hunters lesions are treated, and then take that to your doctor and say, let's talk about this. Teresa says, the IC store sells d powder. Is that helpful to take to prevent UTIs? It can be, yeah. It's, it's not a treatment for a UTI, um, but we just, um, uh, we just brought this in. Um, West Coast Mint. Whoops, sorry. West Coast Mint D-Manos powder. Okay, this is not for quote unquote a bladder wall injury, not for Hunter's lesions uh, or anything like that. But if you are somebody who you are prone to infection, E. coli based infection, using a D-Manos product might be beneficial. And so yes, right on our website. Mary says, the only way you can take B12 is an injection and it works awesome. That's, you know what, Mary, thank you for pointing that out. You know, I forget about that. Yeah, you know, the challenge with talking a lot, your lips get really dry. Hello, Billy. Hi, Erin. Oh, Susie, thank you. I don't know. It's weird today. Plus, I'm all sunburned. For those of you who came in, yes, I'm sunburned. This is from today. My elderly neighbor, 97 years old, died, and his wife, who lives just two doors away, has Alzheimer's. And I went and sat with her today, and she only wanted to sit out in the sunshine. And so I'm all sunburned right here. Susie said, chiropractor saved me at L5S1. I would like to see this listed in the AUA line one, life changer for me. So Susie, 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 
I would really absolutely love for you. I have been told that the AUA uh, IC committee is revising their guidelines as we speak. Uh, that has not been validated by the chairman of the committee, uh, but somebody else told me that that was happening. Um, and this is a perfect opportunity where a patient can really make a difference. Uh, if you want to email me um, with your story, or if you can present a cogent ar argument as to why you think that would be useful, um, I can forward it. Uh, I will tell you, I don't know what, how traditional urology, which tends to be a little bit conservative, feels about chiropractic care. But you're certainly not the only patient who's had benefit when you have a bony abnormality in your pelvis. So guys, remember, you are an anatomical mystery to be served. We got to understand bones. We got to understand muscles. We got to understand organs. And we got to understand nerves. All of those can contribute to the symptoms that you associate with pelvic pain. Susie, could you email me uh, any articles for him? Dr. Amrit Narula, a gastroparesis specialist. I'd love to see that. Jody, been in a flare since Friday. First one in two years. Girl, what do you think triggered it? And what kind of flare are you having? Is it a bladder wall flare or a pelvic floor flare or a hormone flare or a stress flare? What do you think you're having? Cindy says she's been taking slippery elm. It's helped. Cool. You know, I mean, slippery elm is definitely one of those things that, you know, what's the rule? Do no harm. Uh, I see patients have used slippery elm in modest amounts over the years, at least that I'm aware of. It's not the most popular supplement, but, supplement, but it is one that has been kind of calming and soothing, somewhat like marshmallow root, although marshmallow root actually bothers about half of the people who try it. So... Jody says, can you remind me what burning after peeing is a sign of? Well, if the burning uh, uh, while you're peeing is on your skin, then we're definitely looking at estrogen atrophy. If the burning, if you're having an intense spasm-like burning as the last couple of drops are coming out, then we're probably dealing with a um, uh, bladder spasm. If you have a dull, achy vaginal burning and you cannot urinate right away, then you're probably having a pelvic floor spasm. So pain is your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination, points to the bladder wall. Pain after urination points a bit more to the pelvic floor, although there's always wiggle room. Rochelle says, do you think the ones who say they are cured, uh, have cured their IC or cured or in remission? You know, okay, so here's the problem with the word cure. You don't cure an injury, you heal an injury. So if that patient had a pelvic floor issue, which triggered their bladder symptoms, uh, that muscles heal. Muscles can't be healed. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily be in remission. They would be healed, but odds are their pelvic floor would be a little fragile and they could probably hurt it again, which would trigger a pelvic floor flare. Um, if a patient has a chemo-induced cystitis, then you don't cure chemo-induced cystitis because that's a chemical irritation of the bladder wall. You try to heal it by creating an environment that will support healing. Patients who have Hunter's lesions, if it's a viral infection, that's viral infections go from active to uh, passive, you know? So there are moments when it, they can be very active, usually under periods of high stress, and then there are moment, moments when they're quiet. So I mean, I, I don't think you can apply the word cure to this patient population I, uh, in the sense that you don't cure an injury, you heal an injury. But if somebody has a, an example, a, a bladder infection, that can be potentially cured with antibiotics. Uh, Ravonda's asking about the B12 that's, uh, that uh, is a little bit better for uh, ICRs. I don't think anybody's 
ever done research to verify that, but I use the cyanocobalamin. This is the one I use, but people might disagree with me. This is not my area of expertise. Aaron says, your trigger spots are exactly where I was touching. Okay, so Aaron, so your trigger points are right here, right? Okay, so that those are pelvic floor attachment points. My right side, my, my right side is, is very tender. Damn SI problem. For me, uh, aside from having central sensitization, my fundamental problem is pelvic floor driven by SI joint dysfunction. Sean says, tried to go back to the gym today. Not a great idea. I pushed it too much and was embarrassed that you were leaking. You know, um, I'm so proud of you because you went to the gym. But we all learn when you have a pelvic injury, you got to be really, really gentle. And it's very easy to push it. And so you learned an important lesson. Number one, yes, you can go to the gym. Number two, you don't push it. you got to go real slow with the pelvic floor. Hey, let's go down to YouTube for a moment. I Hello, YouTube. I'm so sorry. You guys are hopping today. I love it. All right, let's see what YouTubers are talking about here. Holy moly, you guys are talking. Hello, Vanessa from Florida. Lisa, my vagina is on fire today. I had to hold my urine for... Ooh, girl, she had to hold her urine for four hours this morning. Wow. Wow. Why'd you have to hold it so long? That sucks. You know, guys, let me give you let me give you a, a somewhat controversial tip because I was talking with somebody else about it. Um, you know how, let's say they want to do an ultrasound, they want to do a vaginal ultrasound, and they want you an hour beforehand to drink a big giant glass of water and hold it for an hour or two. And you're like going, what? <laughs> I can't do that. And they're like, just do it anyway. And the answer, the, the reality is, is if you've got an irritated, sensitive bladder, like Hunter's lesions or central sensitization or whatever, the odds, the ability of you being able to do a test like that without pain are pretty slim. Um, and so um, it's very, very important to follow your doctor's instructions. Um I would just say, I don't want to get myself in trouble. In trouble, uh, I I have learned to. Um, oh, I can't. Oh God, I I I. Okay, let's just. I don't need. Oh my God, I hate I hate situations like that. I can't contradict your doctor in any way, shape, or form, and I don't want to do that. I will just tell you that for me personally. Um, I drink a glass of water as I'm as I'm leaving my home, and they've never figured it out. Every test has worked. It goes back to college. They wanted me to drink two, three glasses of water to find an ovarian cyst. I got there in pain. They said, we're sorry, we're running late. Can you hold it for another hour? And I went, no, where's the freaking bathroom? And she goes, okay, just pee half of it out. And it was like, no. How the hell do you pee half of your urine out? How do you do it? I, so I, I just peed and I drank a glass of water and they had no problems. Okay. But I'm telling you, please follow your doctor's instructions. You know what I mean? Oh God. Carmen, I'm getting a hydrodescension September 23rd for the third time to cauterize ulcers. Good. Good. Okay, but but Carmen, hopefully you're talking to the doctor about uh, triamcinolone injections. You should be having that discussion because when you cauterize the lesions, you do leave some scar tissue, whereas if you inject the lesion with a steroid, it doesn't leave scar tissue. All right, let's go back to uh, YouTube. Eileen says, when I get vulvodynia flare, I use petroleum jelly immediately on site for a few days. Susan protects the area. Eileen, interestingly, they just combined my estrogen with petroleum jelly and lidocaine, and I've been using that for a couple of weeks. It's very interesting. Let's 
Lisa, big giant hug, hon. I'm so sorry you're having a bad day. Dear God's woman. You guys, I, I'm so sorry. You all deserve better than a flare and pain. You do. And I'm so sorry that for those of you having a rough time today. You know, I, I was having a rough time today this morning. I don't know if I can show you. Let's see. I have two heating pads. See, I got a heating pad there. And I got a heating pad there because I was having such bad muscle tension and glute pain this morning. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Okay, so Jill, do they know, is, is it the bladder wall that causes the spasms to start in the pelvic floor or the pelvic floor that makes the bladder wall spasm? Hun, you're, it's, it's neither. They're different types of muscle. Your bladder wall is composed of smooth muscle. Your pelvic floor is composed of skeletal muscle, striated muscle. So the smooth muscle of the bladder is not going to impact the skeletal muscle. However, if your bladder is screaming in pain and spasming, the pain reflex is going to make your pelvic floor get tight in a guarding reflex. Um, and if your pelvic floor is super, super tight, um, then that's going to reduce blood flow to your bladder. I call it the chicken first versus the egg dilemma, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, and for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. I don't know if I answered that question correctly for, I mean, thoroughly for you. Lisa says, Lisa so she's glad she didn't accidentally grab Vicks Vapor Rub to use, you know, down below. I did that once with Tiger Balm. Oh, it was a mistake. Lisa asks, what does a bladder wall spasm feel like? Um, it's usually it's just the last couple of drops of urine are coming out. And you, for me, when I had them, and I've only had them once in my life badly, um, it was like the pain shot up my spine and down my legs and I just bent over on the toilet and I was bent over for five minutes until the spasm went away and that was from a bladder infection because I see yours can get bladder infections I've had one in 20 years a real identified bladder infection and we thought it was a flare for two months and I, I didn't get uh, and it turned out it was a real infection, and that's why I had bladder spasms. Shotzi says, my IC was caused by low estrogen causing irritation to the lower trigone of my bladder. HR hormone replacement therapy and diet along with pelvic floor physical therapy helped. Awesome. Classic. Yeah, Kay, people are lamenting the fact that a lot of doctors don't know it's IC Awareness Month. Well, well, people, that's why you get to print out posters and take them to your doctors. Please do. Please do. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Uh, can you buy lidocaine over the counter? Yes, it's called anacreme. Trapped in cage says, who should treat IC, a urologist or OBGYN doctor? Either or. It's really not a question of specialty. It's a question of knowledge. 
there are some fabulous uh, urogynecologists and, and OBGYNs who treat IC, and there are some fabulous urologists who do it. Um, it's just finding one who is experienced. Lisa says, where do we print the posters? Over on icawareness.org is where you can find the posters. They're PDF files. All right, let's go back to Facebook. Rubina says, I'm perimenopausal. I'm having IC symptoms after 10 years. Can estrogen cream help? Yes. Estrogen, using a vaginal estrogen cream will, will deliver estrogen into those tissues to help those tissues produce the protective coating in the vagina, on the vulva, in the urethra, and on the bladder. That is a typical treatment for what we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Aaron says, why can't they find a damn cure? And, and Aaron, it's about your subtype. You got to be more specific than that. When, why can't they find the damn cure for? Insert subtype. Susie. Hey, Susie, can you email me any information on that doctor, Dr. Kent Holtorf? He said his IC patients all have an underlying infection or a virus. I would really love to talk to him about, about both. Because American doctors really have not jumped on the uh, infection bandwagon. And it's, a, it's kind of a mystery as to why. Jody says, I've been bleeding a lot during this flare. Does that mean Hunter's lesions or can that be some other type of irritation? Well, Jody, you know, anytime you see visible blood, you are to call your doctor immediately uh, because they have to figure that out. They've got to figure out why you're bleeding. Yes, it could be a hunter's lesion, but it could be something else. Uh, it could be an untreated infection that's very intense, or it, it, it could be a lot of things. So, Jody, if you're bleeding a lot, you need to call your doctor tomorrow morning and you need to tell them you've got blood in your urine. It's been there for several days, and you need to get in and have them look at your bladder. Uh, and, and see if they can figure out what the hell's going on, because that is not normal. You should not, be, you should not be at home bleeding. They need to figure that out. Rebecca asks, what are Hunter's ulcers? It's not Hunter, it's Hunter, two N's, Hunter's ulcers. They were discovered by a guy named Guy Hunter back in the 1920s after they invented the cystoscope, the early cystoscopes. And they are profound, they are red spot, red lesions in, in the bladder, big, big areas. So this is an example of what a lesion looks like. And so they think five to 10% of quote unquote, the typical IC patients have Hunter's lesions. Some research says a little bit more, but this is a very distinct, different, distinct group when compared to this group, which is more the superficial bladder injury group or bladder driven group. Susie says, can you comment on microgen DNA testing? You know, um, and Karen, yes, thank you for reminding me. So yes, let me talk about microgen. So um, I learned about microgen, I don't know, about 18 months ago from uh, a man that I've been working with for a couple of years who used them to help determine that he had a post-op infection. And he's the one, I, up to that point, I did not know that there was a, a commercially available, affordable way of having your urine tested. Microgen is the first company to come up with really affordable next generation urine testing. And so um, uh, my perspective is all about data. I don't like guessing. Listen, if you've had symptoms for some time and the doctors are saying, hey, maybe you've got infection, or hey, maybe you've got IC, or may, hey, you've got overactive bladder, and they're just treating you based upon a guess, and you're not getting better. What the American Urology Association says is, hey, if a patient isn't improving over time, it's time to revisit the diagnosis. Let's make sure we haven't missed something. 
is it possible that this patient has a hunter's lesion? Is it possible that this patient has pelvic floor dysfunction? Is it possible that this infection has a fungal infection? Because it was our own National Institutes of Health um, a MAP Research Network who discovered that many patients having flares actually have candida infections in their urine, candida infections in their bladder. So the nice thing about next generation testing is that it will allow, it, rather than growing urine out in a, a Petri dish or in a test tube where they have to use a growth medium to get stuff to grow, you put food in there and see what's going to grow. It's called a growth medium. Um, uh, the challenge with typical urine tests like that is you only grow out the bacteria that will, that feed on that growth medium. So there are some bacteria that feed on, on, uh, blood. And anyway, there are all sorts of different, um, growth mediums and most labs will not do that. It's expensive to use lots of different growth mediums. So the cool thing about the next generation testing is it doesn't rely on, getting bacteria to grow, it just identifies DNA found in your urine. And so it will identify good bacteria, it will identify bad bacteria, and most importantly, it will identify fungal infections and antibiotic resistant genes. So the challenge with next generation testing is how do you interpret the results? For some people, the results are really easy. It's like, okay, this patient has a urea plasma or a mycoplasma infection. We should treat that. But for other people, it, it finds little tiny quantities of lots of different bacteria. And we at this point in time don't have a really clear understanding of what a normal bacterial biome is. But what we do know is that it changes over time. It can change on a day-to-day -day basis based upon what you're eating. So some doctors love it, microgen testing. They believe that it has helped them identify very bad drug resistant, I mean, very bad, very elusive infections. Other doctors don't like it because they simply don't know how to interpret the results. Next generation DNA testing is used most at the research level. But again, I like data. I like data. I don't like guessing. If I'm in pain, I want somebody to look and study it and try to figure out why I'm in pain. And that's one of the reasons why I like next generation testing is that it, it will potentially give you more data points to talk with your doctor about. Um, and so, and to me, the most important part of this of, of the whole thing is the identify, identification of antibiotic resistance genes. So let me give you, so here is my, I've had it done twice in the last year, the last 18 months. I did one urine, a urine one and I did a vaginal one. And here's my vaginal one. And so this was done at Microgen, right? Microgen. And if I hold this up, over here, here's the bacterial load. So what they found was Lactobacillus gesseri, which is normal, Prevotella bivia, 3%, which is potentially a pathogen, Streptococcus, 2%, and a little tiny bit of Gardnerella solo they couldn't even assign a percentage to, right? So there's a bacterial load. I, at the time, was absolutely convinced I had a fungal infection. So to me, the most meaningful part of this report was right here, fungi detected, none. And based upon that, I walked away from all antifungals. Um, but the other thing that I think is so incredibly important is here in this last column. And I don't think you can see that. It says amino glycoside resistance. And this is the second test to identify that my body, the, the bacteria in my vagina and in my bladder are resistant to medications called aminoglycosides like amikacin. Now, I will tell you, I have never taken an aminoglycoside. Never. Never. And I'm a, you know, my first training is in pharmacology. Believe me, I know what the hell I put in my body. And so the question is, how the hell did I become resistant to an aminoglycosides when I've never taken it? 
And the answer is pro it pro I probably got that from some sort of food contamination, from back uh, resistant bacteria that I ate. So I think that's interesting. So anyway, you know, now in contrast, Dr. James Malone Lee uh, over in England does not believe in next generation testing. Some doctors do, some doctors don't. I just think the data points are meaningful and it will just create discussion points with your doctor one way or the other. Okay, uh, Karen wants to know about the new Elmer report. So let me pull let me pull this up here real quick. It was a multi-center study and I saved it here. So let me find it. I got to find it in my email. Is that it? Let's see. Ooh, here's a study, adverse reactions to GMSO in humans. Okay, look at this. We got two cool studies. So this is the newsletter that the, that the National Library of Medicine sends out on IC. I got it at three days ago. Uh, six studies. Um, so let's look at the Elmeron one here for a moment. So this was a multi, this is the Elmeron retinal disease issue. This was uh, done uh, at patients in Georgia, Michigan, Portland, Oregon, Atlanta, Georgia, Mountain View, California. And so in this multi-institutional case series, medical records of patients who exhibited characteristic maculopathy in the setting of prior Elmeron use were retrospectively reviewed. Data was collected from August 1st, 2012 to August 1st, 2018. Um, and of the 35 patients, a total of 70 eyes in the study, 97% um, of participants were women. The median duration of Elmeron use was 15 years. The median cumulative exposure was 1.6 kilograms. That's, that's a hell of a lot. The leading visual symptoms were uh, metamorphopsia, blurred vision, and prolonged dark adaptation. Uh, median visual acuity of all eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Examination revealed hyperpigmented hyper macular spots in 34 of 64 eyes with interspersed pale yellow deposits. Although less commonly in eyes, it exhibited retinal pigment epithelial atrophy. All right. It's a lot of data here. These findings suggest that pentosin-associated maculopathy is a vision-threatening condition that can manifest in the setting of long-term exposure to the drug, Multimodal imaging posits a distinctive clinical phenotype, hello, subtype, characterized in this cohort by dynamic alterations within the retinal pigment epithelium and the, at the retinal pigment epithelium photoreceptor interface. All right, so in other words, this was six, re, six eye uh, retinal specialists uh, around the country who verified that they too had seen patients uh, who are taking Elmeron for the long term with eye issues. Again, a small study, but it's meaningful. Now I want to go to, hey man, you know what? Shall we just look at this other study together? Because uh, I didn't notice this. Adverse reactions to DMSO in humans, a systemic review or systematic review. Oh, this is interesting. So this was done in Denmark. So you guys know that DMSO, DMSO in the form of RIMSO50, which is a brand name, is the only bladder installation approved by the US FDA for IC. Back in the 1950s, D the DMSO came into favor because they learned that they could transport kidneys and organs to other hospitals for transplants without damaging the organ. And at that point in time, they really thought DMSO was going to be kind of a miracle drug. They thought 
that this was going to be, it was going to cure a whole bunch of medical conditions. So back in the early 1960s, it was tested on many, 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 many things. I will tell you, it absolutely failed everything, but it helped a little tiny bit of IC patients. And as a result, it was FDA approved for IC. I know that because I interviewed the doctor, Dr. Stanley Jacob, who is the guy who got it through the FDA approval. And you can find that interview on our website. It was probably 15, 18 years ago. So the big issue with DMSO is what the hell does it do in the bladder? <laughs> you know, it's like it has many, many methods of action. Uh, uh, what we do know is patients, when we try it, is that in addition to sometimes uh, ex uh, excreting a terrible garlic odor for 24 hours after having a DMSO treatment, DMSO can be remarkably painful. One of the most mistakes I made in my early IC career was that I... Um, I tried to drive home with DMSO in my bladder. <laughs> that was a horrible mistake. The pain was terrible. Uh, then we had a couple of researchers, C. Suba Packer, who was trying to understand more about what DMSO could do to the bladder. What she found was that at the FDA approved dosage of 25%, it caused irreversible bladder spasms. And it was at that point at the American Urology, uh, American Urology Association meeting that pretty much every urologist said, we will only use it in a cocktail form at a much lower dose. So anyway, here's a study in, on DMSO and what does it do with respect to adverse events. Uh, today, DMSO is used to the, for cryopreservation of stem cells, treatment of IC, and it's a penetrating vehicle for drugs. Many adverse reactions have been described in relation to the use of DMSO, but to our knowledge, no overview of the existing literature has been made. Our aim was to conduct a review describing the adverse reactions. So they looked at 109 studies. A gastrointestinal and skin reactions were the most common reported adverse event reaction to DMSO. Most reactions were transient without need for intervention. A relationship between the dose of DMSO given and the occurrence of adverse reactions was seen, which is what CISO by Packer saw. They concluded that DMSO may cause a variety of adverse reactions that are mostly transient and mild but that the dose of DMSO plays an important role in the occurrence of adverse events. DMSO seems to be safe to use in small, low doses. All right, there you go, man. There's your, there's your, there's your nerdy lesson for the day. <laughs> Let me drink some water. I know some of you on the East Coast are eating dinner now. 710 on the East Coast. It's 410 here in California. Lisa, I'm not looking at Twitter right now. I'm basically not looking at Twitter hardly at all. It just annoyed me. Nan Marie says, my newest pictures of your lesions are terrifying. I have nothing but, but red and it's awful. All right, so Nan, so now we've got to focus on lesion therapy. And we have good ways of treating lesions. So this is about you engaging in your doctor with a discussion about what is the best treatment for, for treating these lesions. It's either going to be a steroid injection into the center of the lesion, or it's going to be a laser therapy or fulguration of the lesion. Okay. But in the meantime, until that's done, your bladder's really, really sensitive right now. So you got to be perfect with your diet, my friend. Don't do anything that's going to irritate that bladder. No coffee, no soda, no alcohol, no vitamin C, no citrus, no cranberry, nothing like that. You have the equivalent of an open wound in your bladder. I mean, this is what your bladder looks like right here, one of these pictures. But again, I, I, I just want to say this again, over and over, these disappear in some patients just spontaneously. It's one of the really interesting things about... Um, about lesions. Colette says, I mainly get urethra spasms. Why is that? You know, um, I have a really good blog on our website, The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. I would encourage you to please go read that. The urethra is kind of the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. And so if you're at the, if you're perimenopausal, um, uh, it's usually the urethra that starts screaming and telling you that you're starting to lose mucus from estrogen atrophy, but the urethra also can be remarkably chemically sensitive. 
if I put on a pair of underwear washed in cheer or tied, I don't think they make cheer anymore, or using any fabric softener, usually within five minutes, I will start getting urethra pain. Also important to note that you've got muscles right down by your urethra, really low muscles. So you could potentially have some pelvic floor dysfunction that is triggering those muscles to tighten around your urethra. Susie likes throat coat tea with slippery elm. Good to know. I like traditional medicinals. That's the name of the company that makes the throat coat tea. Joyce says, did you know that the show Chasing the Cure will have someone on it with IC? Yeah, it's going to be. It's going to be really interesting to see how they approach it. Do we have a date or time as to when that's going to happen, Joyce? So there's a, there's a show called uh, Chasing the Cure where patients who have previously unsolved problems send their cases to a team of doctors who then try to figure out what they're, what's going on. And so an IC patient, I think she's a leader of a Facebook group, actually, was able sent her story to Chasing the Cure, and they have agreed to accept her story. And so that's going to be fascinating. It'll be interesting to see how they approach it. They may go old school. They may go go new school. It's it, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I'll be very. I, I I hope that we all won't be disappointed in what they say, incurable bladder disease, which would be that they just looked at the textbook instead of the new research. Oh, guys, and by the way, on um, like literally one of my favorite shows on TV um, right now for the last couple of years has been Frontline on PBS. They do incredible documentaries. So they did a great documentary on uh, brain injury and football players. They are doing an incredible documentary tonight on the um, Flint, uh, wa uh, Flint, Michigan water issue. And the early screen, the early screens for that are amazing. And I think we should all watch it just to make sure it doesn't happen in our communities to see the stupidity that led to that happening. Um, so uh, tonight uh, on PBS Frontline, I, I think it's at eight o'clock. Uh, so check it out. Joyce says, I think this is our chance to have the, have the world uh, if doctors talk about it um, because this is a weird condition that needs looking into so we can get more treatment options. We need help. Um, I mean, I agree. Every, you know, it may be that one brand new doctor who's in medical school right now who actually is the one who makes the biggest connection. I'm willing to listen to anybody. I just, I'm, what I'm not willing to listen to is all or not all or nothing statements. I don't like all or nothing statements. Uh, Patty asked if I could talk about Premarin. I suffer from repeated UTIs and my doctor suggested I go on that. You know, Premarin is, is a mass market estrogen product. It's a, it's a typical topical estrogen therapy. It's called Premarin because it comes from pregnant mare urine. And the challenge with Premarin is it's very expensive. It's a perfect example of a big pharma corporate greed um, more than anything else. I mean, it could cost hundreds of dollars. Um, the challenge with Premarin, aside from absolute disgust at the industry itself, keeping horses pregnant and killing their babies, um, uh, is that they have to use a lot of other chemicals and preservatives because it needs to have a shelf life. And so uh, many patients report that Premarin can be irritating. So generally what uh, I see patients do or people who are sensitive do is we go to a compounding pharmacy instead and we get a preservative free formula. And the really cool thing about that is it's cheap. <laughs> you're not spending hundreds of dollars. You're spending 40 bucks for a three month supply. Um, and you've removed the chemicals that could potentially trigger a flare. And so um, Patty, um, I wouldn't be afraid of it. Um, I would Google it, do some research. Topical estrogen is considered much less risky than estrogen that you take by mouth, but don't take it from me. Re read up on it on the internet um, uh, and then talk to your doctor about, about the concerns. I will tell you that I use uh, topical estrogen every, every day at this point in time. 
Lisa asks, is Premarin the same as estradiol? And the answer is no, it's, an, it's another variant of an estrogen. And I, it's on the tip of my tongue, uh, but uh, you can go, Google it. Joy says, uh, it's an amazing show, getting back to finding the cure. Uh, and I feel one that could help us. Absolutely. I'm all, I'm all for it. Uh, I saw Dr. Parsons down in San Diego, who's an expert in the field, but still no miracle. Dr. Parsons is uh, 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 kind of a go the godfather of the IC movement. He's the guy who invented Elmeron, the Puff questionnaire, uh, the potassium sensitivity test. He's dedicated his career to IC. I, he's uh, only seen, he's older and he's, I think, only seen patients one day a week or one day a month. And he's the Elmeron guy, so he focuses on Elmeron. But he has other theories about IC. What was his other theory? He believes that it's a, a very specific type of bladder wall dysfunction with What did he call it? Um, not proton. Um, Cations. Cations. C H I O N S. Can't get into it. I'd have to read it to go into it with you guys. Joyce says, Jill, can you go over the subtypes of IC? Why, yes, I can go over the, oh God, my butt hurts. Oh, welcome to my life. I just can't sit for long periods of time. My pelvic floor and my glute muscles are just rebelling as I sit here rubbing my butt. All right, you want the subtypes of IC? I will give you the subtypes of IC. So please know that uh, this is something the doctors have been working on now for, okay, hold on, I gotta tilt this a wee bit. Is it gonna stay tilted? Stay. All right. All righty, so again, um, what were we, what were you talking about earlier? And that is the variants of IC. And it was really the European IC researchers who were the ones who first took this on when they created the European guidelines for IC about a decade ago. And their subtyping is, is, is based on uh, biopsy results and what they see in the tissue along with what the bladder looks like. So in their system, there are 12 to 16 variants of IC, uh, of bladder pain syndrome. Actually, in Europe, only patients with Hunter's lesions are diagnosed with IC. Everybody with symptoms but without Hunter's lesions are diagnosed with bladder pain syndrome. Um, and that started a ripple effect around the world. And now what you see is that researchers and clinicians around the world are creating their own subtyping systems. In, in Europe, I mean, I'm sorry, in Canada, they use a system called, um, uh, I was gonna say urgent PC, that's not right, uh, U-point, U-point MD. And in the U-point system, they ask doctors to uh, look at the bladder wall they ask doctors to consider the symptoms of the bladder. They ask doctors to look at the muscle. They ask doctors to check for infection. They ask doctors to look for uh, the presence of other pain conditions. And they ask doctors to look for high levels of anxiety and catastrophizing. And then based upon what that system finds, those doctors create a customized treatment protocol um, because that anxiety is actually a big piece of, of this if you've got central sensitization like I do. In, your, in America, there's considerable debate as yet. And in fact, the chair of the um, IC committee with the American Urology Association was saying, let's not, let's not jump too soon on any subtyping bandwagon because we need time. 
Um, but but the reality is is that there are clear variants, and so I use the subtyping phenotyping system that was proposed by Dr. Christopher Payne, who ran the IC research program at Stanford University for 25 years, and he also chaired a couple of National Institutes of Health meetings on IC. He's a wonder. He's dedicated his career to IC as well as to the repair of I think fistulas, fistulas. He's often in Africa repairing things. He's a, he's the executive director of a nonprofit uh, in Africa or that cares for patients in Africa. Lovely, lovely man. So he introduced his system a couple years ago and he did it in a very provocative way because what he basically said in his journal article is that we should treat IC patients like cancer patients. And of course, you know, as soon as you say cancer, people start panicking and, and it's like, wait, 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 why would you even say cancer and scare people? And his argument is a really good argument because what he says is that when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, they're given a very clear, specific diagnosis. And as a result of that, um, there is a very clear treatment plan. So you're told if you've got breast cancer that you've got estrogen dependent type blank, blank, blank of the left breast, right? And based upon that diagnosis, you pretty much know what you need to do. There is an intuitive pathway. Um, in contrast, if you're diagnosed with IC, there's, he argues correctly that there's no intuitive pathway, that you really don't know what to do next. And so, and so how do we get that intuitive pathway? And the answer is with specificity. We need a more specific diagnosis. And so he proposed five variants. And let me just go through these really quickly here. Hold on a sec. I'm just cleaning my glasses here. Oh, not quite. So in his system, here, hold on. All right. Using his system, I see subtype one is Hunter's lesions. Now, everybody in the world absolutely agrees this is a separate and distinct group of patients. This bladder, when you biopsy it, it's filled with inflammation. This bladder, when you biopsy it, not a lot of inflammation. So based upon the biopsy results alone, this presents in a very, very different way. And every researcher and every clinician around the world agrees this is a unique group of patients. So much so, again, in Europe, uh, you know, only these patients are diagnosed with IC. Okay, so um, what makes this so important is trying to understand why Hunter's lesions, uh, you know, occur. And again, we've got the new research from Europe that has linked Hunter's lesions to viral infections. So that's absolutely fascinating. We also know that Hunter's lesions don't respond to typical bladder therapies like Elmeron and installations, but Hunter's lesions do respond beautifully to lesion-specific therapy triamcinolone injection, cauterization, fulguration, things like that. So you can come on over to our website, icnetwork.org, and read more about Hunter's lesions. And I've got great videos, diagnostic videos, so you can see what they look like. Hunter's lesions are known for what we call a waterfall-like effect. Uh, when you stretch a, a Hunter's lesion, they bleed profusely. They bleed profusely, so much so that they look like a bloody waterfall. Um, okay, so if you have a hydro distension, I'm sorry guys, and whenever I stand up, my lighting gets weird and then I think I look old and I'm gonna be anal about this, I apologize. Okay, so if, so if you've ever had a hydro distension and you walk out of that procedure with a lot of blood in your urine for a couple of days and the odds are you probably had at some point in time something like a lesion bleeding. But if you have a hydro distension and you do, you're not passing blood clots, then you probably don't have a hydro. You probably don't have lesions. I mean, that's an extreme generalization, though. I try not to do that. But when I'm working with, with patients, that's one of the questions I ask is when you had your hydro, did you bleed profusely? 
Did you pass blood clots? And that's, again, what we would expect to see with Hunter's lesions. All right. I see subtype 2, bladder wall injury. Okay. So these are the patients who have pain as their bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination, but they don't have lesions. And in this subtype, we have sub-subtypes. There are variants in this group because the bladder, like any other part of the body, can be injured. So what usually triggers bl the bladder uh, or injures the bladder is some sort of chemical exposure. Chemotherapy, well-known bladder irritant, ketamine. If you were as a kid, went to raves and you took ketamine, ketamine badly damages the bladder wall. DMSO, if it's used in the uh, a non diluted form, will damage the bladder wall. Um, so that's one thing we're going to look at is consistent chemical injury. The second thing we're going to look at is estrogen atrophy. What is the health of your bladder? Is your bladder thin? Is your mucosal barrier thin? That's something that's important. And this is a subtype where, yes, we would probably also be looking for chronic infection. If you have fever, if you have recurring positive cultures or even recurring negative cultures, but other signs of infection like fever, then yeah, this is a subtype where we would be looking for some type of chronic infection. But then the question becomes, what kind of infection? It could be a bacterial infection or it could be a fungal infection. And I want to I want to read to you something. I want to read you something real quick. I had a I had um, a a patient email me, and I want to read the first sentence of a story. Hold on a sec. Let me find this because I think you will find this interesting. So here is. A, a young man with IC. Before most of this started, I had candida on my toenails. And when I was graduating, graduating high school, they did not go away with medicated antifungals. Um, then he got a white patch of candida on his tongue. Okay. So in his case, it doesn't look like it was bacterial. It looked like the origin for his is indeed probably fungal. Okay. So, and there may be more. There, there, the autoimmune subtype, I don't think would be in this one, but it could be in this one. The, um, uh, the porphyria subtype might fit into this subtype. And Dr. Payne says in his proposal, there are sub subtypes. So if we had a, a, an arrow here, one arrow would be for menopause, one arrow would be for chronic infection, one arrow would be for chemical irritation. And I would imagine in five years, we'll have three or four more arrows, which, which will help us understand why the bladder wall can become injured or traumatized or symptomatic. So for, the, for this group of patients, again, you have pain as a bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. Okay. I see subtype three using the pain subtyping system is pelvic floor driven. And he and I both believe that this is probably the biggest subtype. So these are the patients whose symptoms began after some sort of muscle trauma, having a baby, a car accident, a fall, riding your motorcycle for eight hours, uh, being a paratrooper and falling repeatedly on your, on your pelvis, um, being an ice skater, being a gymnast, if you were sexually abused and had repeated traumas that way, or even one bad trauma that way. So this, these are the patients who, when we look at their bladder, their bladder is pretty healthy. Their bladder looks pretty normal, but they still have severe symptoms. And the question is why? And the answer is because they have muscle injury, muscle trauma. you got to remember with the pelvic floor... Okay, so you got it. The thing about the pelvic floor that's so important is it's the only major muscle group in the human body that is intricately involved in other bodily functions. So here's your pelvic floor. It goes from left to right, front to back, low to high. And your pelvic floor has holes in it. There's a hole in it for your urethra. For women, there's a hole in it for your vagina. And there's a hole in it for your, for your rectum and for your bowel. 
So the purpose of the pelvic floor really is to hold organs in place and to stabilize the hips and you know, all, it's, it's a stability issue as, as well as kind of holding things in place issue, right? So, so the ball would has the potential of being your bladder. So here we go. Uh, well, your, your bladder would actually be a little bit higher, about two inches higher. If your pelvic floor is too tight, it's going to be really hard to let things out. So the hallmark symptom of somebody with pelvic floor dysfunction is not being able to start your urine stream right away, that you, you hesitate for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds before you can let urine out. You might, you might have to strain. You feel like you have to strain. That's because your muscles are so tight, you're not relaxing. So what do you do? You, you strain and you push, which unfortunately just tightens your muscles even more. But then the opposite can also occur. And that is when your muscles get so weak, things start to drop and you can end up with a prolapse of some type. And so your pelvic floor muscle health is really important. The downside of having tight muscles is blood flow. And this is what I do to demonstrate it. So look, if you squeeze, Blood flow goes away. See how it turned white? And now look, it's taking a couple of seconds for the blood flow to be restored in my skin. So here you have, wait, wait. So here you have a nice, healthy bladder. You have a nice, healthy bladder. Nothing freaking wrong with your bladder. And then you fall badly. Bam. So these muscles are now squeezing a healthy bladder. So what happens then is your bladder is not getting the blood flow that it needs for proper oxygenation and proper nutrition. So is it easy? So can your bladder be healthy when it is being squeezed or confined or impacted by very, very tight muscles? No. So here you have no freaking idea that you have a muscle injury. You really don't unless you, you know, unless you felt it right away. Your first symptoms, frequency, urgency. You go to the doctor or you call the doctor and it's like, hey doc, I have an infection. Can I have some antibiotics? I mean, this is what we did all the time 20 years ago. Hey doc, think I have an infection. Can I have antibiotics? Sure, I'll send them to you. You, they, you, you barely even went to the doctor's office 20 years ago. So they give you antibiotics, they didn't work. You finally end up in your doctor's office. The doctor does a culture, it's negative. And the doctor goes, well, maybe you've got overactive bladder. And they put you on overactive bladder meds, ditropan, detrol, stuff like that. They don't work. You give those a shot, a couple months, three to six months. You go back to the doctor. Hey, it's like, hey, man, I still have frequency urgency. And the doctor goes, oh, man, there's this condition called interstitial cystitis. And boy, I really don't want to tell you about it because I'd really hate for you to have it. But I think you have it. And they give you Elmeron medication. They give you IC meds like Elmeron. And they don't work. And the reality, the ugly reality here is you had a, and, 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 and the challenge here is when they look in your bladder, it's healthy. They, you know, they actually look in your bladder and it's like, well, your bladder is completely normal. I'm one of those patients. My bladder is completely normal. Okay. So the fundamental flaw here is not a bladder wall dysfunction. The fundamental problem is tight muscles. So this patient is never going to get better on bladder medications uh, because that does not solve the problem. And the problem is poor blood flow. What will solve the problem? Restoring blood flow. How do we restore blood flow? Pelvic floor physical therapy, right? And so when you have, so when you go for a pelvic floor assessment, uh, what, the, your, what the physical therapist is going to do is they're just going to study your frame. They're going to have you walk up and down the, the hallway. They want to see how you're walking. They're going to look for tension patterns. Like I demonstrated before, and one person said here, if you, uh, if you palpate right on the inside of your hip bones and it's tender, little tiny bit tender, that's a that's a pelvic floor attachment point. Or you go, I know for me, 
my first year, I would walk around like this. And I felt better when I pushed in right below, like two inches below my, uh, my belly button. And what I didn't know is I was also pushing on pelvic floor muscles. I knew it felt better, right? I, I knew it felt better. Um, so they're going to, they're going to look for muscle tension patterns and, and, and listen, I just want to say, I want to be really, really clear with this. If you have a pelvic floor assessment and they touch muscle and they trigger your pain, hallelujah, baby, they found it. They found it. That's fantastic news. But some of you get afraid of that. Some of you are really frightened by that. It's like, oh my God, I don't want to go back. It hurt. And some of you do. Some of you walk away. Please don't walk away. There's no pill that can fix tight muscles consistently. Yes, you can take a muscle relaxant, but it's temporary. What we'd like to do is proper muscle rehabilitation to get that muscle behaving normally. And that means a finger in your vagina, or if you're a man, in your rectum, gently touching muscle. And I just had it again. Um, uh, when did I have it? Uh, last Wednesday? Um, so the first time I did it, well, I mean, I'm in my, I'm in my second round of physical therapy. I did it two years ago and it was very, very successful for me. And then my SI joint got worse. My muscles got tighter, yada, yada, yada. I'm back in it again. Okay. So the first time we did it uh, and she did the muscle assessment again. Oh yeah. It hurt, <laughs> but it's like, okay, what the hell are you touching right now? It's like, okay, I'm on your left side and I'm working with your left piriformis and I'm working with your left. And what's so interesting is that she could actually touch uh, the, the, the bone, the, 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 I don't even know the name of the bone, uh, the bone. She could actually go all the way over to the bones that, that encompass the uh, pelvic floor. I don't know the name of it. I should, I don't. Um, and so she could go all the way over to the bone and then she was kind of just gently touching muscle. And I will tell you, it hurt. It wasn't terrible. I tend to laugh when I'm in pain. So I was kind of laughing when she was doing it. But when I got in the car, I started crying, you know, I was like, okay, that really hurt. That was the first time I went back last week, three weeks later. And I said, okay, we found it. And holy hell, yeah, that was pretty uncomfortable when I actually got in the car. And she goes, okay, that's important. We know where we're working. We're just going to back off dramatically. And that's what we did. And uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. But don't be afraid of the pain. Seriously, if they can touch it and it triggers the pain, that is a tremendous victory. But at the next appointment, you have to tell them to back off and you go very, very slowly with the pelvic floor. This is not a more is not better approach. And in fact, what she had me do, she gave me a home exercise to do with my wand. And um, I did it and I, and I did too much and I kind of hurt myself and I had, and I confessed, that's what I do. I tend to double things because I want to get better. And she's like, Jill, you know better. You don't double anything with your pelvic floor. You go slow. And she went slow this time and it's good. And I'm, you know, it's making progress. Okay. Now, again, I call it the chicken versus the egg dilemma, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. So a good portion of you, your symptoms began with a muscle injury that started squeezing your bladder and squeezing your other organs and your vulva, your vulva and, or, you know, blood supply to the vulva and blood supply to the prostate and stuff. But then you've also got that patient group whose symptoms really legitimately started with a bladder injury, like a chemotherapy patient. So here's a person with a normal pelvic floor, normal pelvic floor, and bam, their bladder gets hurt by chemo. And so their bladder is pulsing in pain. So what happens to these patients is your pelvic floor gets tight in a guarding reflex. And so for these patients, our therapeutic priority is to calm and soothe the bladder wall. When we calm and soothe the bladder wall and the bladder starts screaming in pain, the pelvic floor muscles should relax. 
So again, think about the Chris Payne protocol and intuitive treatment pathway. If it begins with the bladder, we're going to try to calm the bladder. If it begins with the muscle, we're going to focus more on the muscle. I see subtype four using his system is pudendal neuralgia. So this is the nerve component to it. These are patients whose symptoms are very positional in nature. You're fine when you stand, but when you bend over, it hurts. Or when you sit down, it hurts. Or when you squat down, it hurts. People with pudendal neuralgia means that they have something that's compromising their pudendal nerve. So you might have um, um, uh, P PGAD, persistent genital arousal disorder, where the, the pudendal nerve is being compromised and as a consequence, it gets irritated and then you get this really creepy kind of slightly aroused pain sensation. I had it for about a month on my first year and then it went away. Um, and that is because your muscles have gotten so tight, they're squeezing on a nerve. So therapeutically for these patients, they're going to be focusing on trying to figure out where and why the nerve is compromised and then addressing that. So in some cases, it might be pelvic floor physical therapy, um, but they also might do some therapies that will calm that nerve down or do other things that will kind of lower the threshold of pain. And last but not least is central sensitization, IC subtype 5. This is in his system kind of more the inherited subtype. Um, so this is also my subtype because every woman in my family on my mother's side going back three generations has IC. It's characterized by exquisitely sensitive skin. We have um, so we have a sensitive skin, it's sensitive nerves in our skin. We've got sensitive nerves in our stomach, in our gut, in our bladder, on our vulvas, in our rectums. Um, and we don't look at that as a disease process. In some cases, it's just evolutionary adaptation. If you're of a Northern European descent, we found years and years ago, 20 plus years ago, kind of correlation with that. And that kind of makes sense because people in Norway and Sweden, where I come from, didn't have a lot of exposure to stuff and we needed to be sensitive to find food and to smell food and water. Okay. I've talked about that extensively. You can read about that more on our website. Central sensitization can also happen after injury, traumatic injury, um, uh, where um, kind of other, prefer other nerves uh, in that area, you can develop allodynia where other nerves near the injury become involved, or perhaps it can become systemic. And so in this case, therapeutically, our focus is going to be on number one, finding all of the pain generators and making sure they're all addressed. So if you've got a throbbing stomach, a throbbing bladder, and a throbbing foot, uh, we're not going to leave one throbbing because that one that's still throbbing is going to amp up all the other nerves. So we want to try to address everything that's going on. The goal is to lower the volume on, on all the nerve stimulation. The odds are, too, if you've got central sensitization, you have a wicked sense of smell, you're chemically sensitive, you're food sensitive, you're drug sensitive. And so the odds are you're already adapting your daily life. You're probably not bringing chemicals into your home and all sorts of stuff like that because you already know you're sensitive. People with central sensitization, we tend to be much more comfortable in a quiet environment rather than a city, which is why I live in the country and I'm looking at hillsides right now. Explains my life, baby. So those are the, those are, that's the subtyping system that was proposed by Chris Payne several years ago. And again, I was just talking with a doctor in Atlanta, new doctor in Atlanta, who uses this subtyping system very, very, she loves it, feels it's incredibly helpful for her as she works with patients. Let me drink some water. <laughs> oh. Alrighty then, Aaron Glidden, can we still submit entries? Yes, please, everybody, everybody, everybody. We need posters. 
We need people. We need IC patients to enter their posters in IC Awareness Month. Uh, uh, we pick three winners: first place, hundred dollar Amazon gift certificate; second place, fifty dollar Amazon gift gift certificate; third place, twenty five dollar Amazon gift certificate. Not only for posters, but for memes. Um, our mail service uh, ha is having some sort of issue, and so. I learned that the email addresses that I set up for the memes and the posters um, was was were not working, and so if you um, sent me a poster in the last ten days or a meme, I need you to send it again. I see network at mac.com, and they are trying to figure out what is going on with the mail server uh, uh, that we're using uh, because none of our forwarders are working, including my own address. My own email address is not working right now. Uh, it's a service called Mailgun. So they got to get, so anyway, please enter. We need entries because usually our poster winner becomes the official poster for next year. And it's a great opportunity to be creative and to share your viewpoint and get your kids, give them crayons, just go for it. We, we want entries, posters and memes. Please go to icawareness.org and you can learn all about it. Send your entry to icnetwork at mac.com or call me and I can give it to you. And I'll probably be taking entries for uh, maybe two months because of that, because of the problem with the mail. I'm not sure. We'll see how many we get. Joyce said she didn't understand the subtypes. Hopefully my explanation just helped you. Tanya says, can you discuss icy belly fat or menopausal belly? I'm pretty thin, but have the lower ab belly. Yeah, there it is, right there. <laughs> See, <laughs> I have no shame. I'll show you my belly fat. I got no problem with that. Um, she says, I'm pretty thin like me. You have a lower ab belly. I'm in my 60s. Had a scan years ago, tiny kidney stone. Doctor says it's gas because my weight goes up and down each day. I suspect estradiol cream could cause weight gain. So, so here's my take on it. First of all, first of all, Tanya, seriously, every woman out there order this book on Amazon. This is the new book on the vulva and the vagina by Dr. Jen Gunter. And this is fabulous. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Has a really good discussion of uh, what happens with menopause to the vulva, to the vagina, really, really good. So, and it also talks about Premarin and the pros and cons of all those, but just a fabulous, and it's funny. She is hella funny. She's so funny. Um, and she is fierce. I, 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 as a role model, she's great. Like she takes on, uh, permanent hair, pubic hair removal. And how dangerous that is. I mean, she, she just lets you have it. Um, my theory on this, and this is supported by, uh, oh, we, um, yeah, it was in an article I did on uh, endometriosis and IC. Um, is that the human body stores estrogen in fats? And we know that because women who are obese produce, a, produce extra estrogen, which then makes them more prone to endometriosis. And so obesity is a risk factor for somebody with, I, I think, endometriosis, but I think it was in my fibroid article. Anyway, so the theory, the kind of the informal guess slash theory is that because we have lost our ovarian estrogen production, our body is looking to store estrogen somewhere else. And that's why we start developing some belly fat. Because uh, it's really hard to get rid of this belly fat. Um, and, and that, so it, 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 it kind of appears like a biological imperative that we've got to have estrogen stored somewhere. And if you don't have ovaries anymore, where is it going to store it? It stores it in fat. So that's my guess. Now your doctor says your gas is, 
is, it says is gas. Now, the other thing that we know is the icy belly. And with the icy belly, you know, so with the icy belly, you can wake up with a flat stomach and like hours later, you look four months pregnant. And um, uh, th that is what Dr. Th what Dr. Thea Haridi said when he answered that question about the icy belly is he thought it was an inflammatory reaction, some sort of inflammatory process to the flare you're having because the icy belly tends to come and go. You, you're, you got a flat belly in the morning and, you know, then you have a flare and by three o'clock in the afternoon, you look five months pregnant, you go to bed and the next morning you wake up with a flat belly again. So there's this kind of, that's kind of the theory about, about the IC belly. Joyce says, where do I read about the subtypes? You read about them on the IC network website, hon. We're the only group. You know, you guys, you, you got to understand that I'm a, I'm a geek in, in a lot of different ways. And, and um, I, I'm very bold about sharing the latest research and uh, not only sharing it here in our live streams, but also over on our website. We're the only group that really gets in depth into some of this stuff. And so you're going to read about the subtypes over on the IC network website. I don't believe that the other IC websites are talking about it, even though every single researcher is talking about it. You know, I sat on the Army IC research panel for almost a decade. So, you know, I kind of approach it from a, a more academic perspective. Nan says, I've had horrible sensitivity to lights for five years. I've gotten Elmeron installations for years. So, so Nan, you need to have your eyes examined. Uh, come on over to our website, print out the article on Elmeron pigmentary maculopathy. Take that to your eye doctor and get yourself tested. Because light sensitivity, is uh, low light sensitivity particularly, is the hallmark sign of the retina changing with, with uh, Elmeron. Um, so our website address is icnetwork.org, no hyphen, or ic-network.com, and ic-network.org will work. You know, I just tried to get them all. Hello, Libby. Hi, Susan. Hi, Rochelle. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Kate. Hi, Lauren. Susan says, I did not have pain during physical therapy, but I did in the four to five days following. Hell yeah, yeah. The physical therapy left for, uh, the physical therapist left for reading a book, Ending Pelvic Pain for Females for Home Exercises. I've done tightness, but unsure of that type of physical therapy. You know, you know, Susan, I mean, I did it first after my hysterectomy when I had levator spasms for 10 months. And I honestly, it felt like there was a fist up my vagina, grabbing onto my viscera and pulling downwards. It was the creepiest, most painful sensation. And um, the doctor eventually diagnosed uh, as involuntary levator spasms. And um, he said to me, he said, you know, uh, we can fix us. You need to go in physical therapy immediately. And I'm like, sign me up. I don't want to live this way because um, I could barely sit down. And he goes, well, I need to tell you, it's going to be really painful. And a lot of women drop out. And I went, I'm not a lot of women. I'm going to stick out. And yeah, the first two appointments were pretty painful. Uh, by the third appointment, the spasms had stopped. And we have uh, large research studies that show that pelvic floor physical therapy is remarkably successful at reducing the symptoms of IC. National Institutes of Health funded pelvic floor physical therapy. The first study, I think, came out in 2008, which proved that pelvic floor physical therapy could reduce frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. And that's when the world, IC world changed, because up to that point, everybody was focusing on IC as a bladder disease. And then we get a research study showing muscle therapy works. 
And not only did it, not only that it worked, that it worked spectacularly well, better than any other therapy that had been tried up to that point. And that was a turning point for, for the IC world because that's when everybody went, hmm, maybe this isn't a bladder disease. Maybe it involves muscle. And we can thank Rhonda Cotterinos, the first physical therapist, to, to go to an IC meeting and make the case for it. And she, they kind of laughed at her at first, but now she teaches the class to the doctors on it. So pelvic floor injury, pelvic floor physical therapy is remarkably successful at reducing symptoms. You just, you can't be afraid of it. You got to willing to give it, you got to be willing to give it a shot. And it's hard. Gina says, can you talk a little bit more about PGAD? You've been having a, dr a dramatic episode of it. You know, again, PGAD is really just nerves, a ner the pudendal nerve that's being irritated, persistent genital arousal disorder, usually from the pudendal nerve that has been impacted in some way. And let's see if she has this in the book. I don't, I'm curious. Let's see what Dr. Gunter says. If she has, I don't know if she has it in the book. Hold on. No, unfortunately, she doesn't talk about it in the book. You know, Google it. I've got articles on it. I think I've got at least one article on it on our website. It's real. It happens. I call it one of the dirty secrets of IC because when it happens, patients are very reluctant to talk about it because they think that their doctor is going to say that, uh, you know, they have some weird sex perversion that they like painful sex or something like that, which is certainly not true. And, and so, you know, it's very, very important that you tell your doctor any weird symptom you're having, anything, even the little tiny ones, you know, just that weird random thing that happens once in a blue moon, that's all important to share with your doctor. Cheryl says, does anybody have flares when they take Motrin? Cheryl, there was a doctor, and I don't remember who it was, who made a correlation with Motrin and flares. And if you go over to the IC Network website, I don't remember the, I wanna say it was Ray Rackley at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm not sure. Um, I think it was him where he was very, very concerned about people taking some of the over-the-counter stuff and how it might trigger some stuff. I think that was Ray Rackley, but I think you can find an article on it on our website. Sylvia, why is there not a lot of talk about Hunter's ulcers? Well, I talk about it every single meeting. Um, in Europe, they talk about it all the time. I mean, it's not it's not like people don't talk about it. You got to we you got to look at where you are. You know, I mean, if you're getting information from Facebook, people and pay, Facebook aren't necessarily differentiating. You know, the subtypes and talking about the variants. If you go over onto the IC Network website and go into our support forum, you're going to find support forums dedicated to Hunter's ulcers. Um, but um, we talk about it all the time. And I think the biggest issue with Hunter's ulcers is making sure the doctors have the correct training so that they can, number one, identify it, and number two, treat it. And it was the Europeans who, uh, uh, when they came out with their guidelines, it was, it was really interesting. In Europe, you cannot receive a diagnosis until you have a biopsy. And having a biopsy requires a hydrodistension. And I remember when they proposed their guidelines, I was in Washington, D.C. at the meeting, and I went up to Dr. Magnum Fall, who is like the grandfather of IC researchers in Europe, very, very famous doctor. And I said to him, I said, the problem with your protocol is that American insurance companies simply will not pay for a hydrodistension from everybody. And his answer was a very, his answer was interesting because uh, 
let's just say he was not complimentary of the American healthcare system, and he had every right not to be complimentary. It is a failing of our American system. But in America, if you look at our AUA guidelines, one of the things that they're trying to address in our guidelines is unnecessary trauma. So in America, urologists respect the fact that many patients refused to come back to a urologist after their first or second appointment because they were traumatized in some way. And so if you read the AUA guidelines for IC, you will see that one of their priorities is to reduce trauma. And, and that's the key motivating reason why they don't want to do unnecessary hydrodistensions. Hydrodistensions are only done if the diagnosis is in doubt. Lisa says, Jill, you did a good video on subtypes. I did, and it's right on our Facebook page under videos. So for anybody who wants to watch that again, me going over it slowly, it's right on our it's on our YouTube channel, but it's right on our Facebook page under videos, the vi our, my video on subtyping. Lori, is stomach swelling and weight gain part of IC? Well, I just kind of talked about that. Weight gain is not part of IC. Weight gain, however, can happen with certain medications. So if you're taking amitriptyline or any of the antidepressants, yes, uh, we call it the Elevil 20. They're notorious for causing weight gain. The stomach swelling, icy belly is absolutely real. It happens during flares and it tends to come and go. And that's why we always tell patients it's in your best interest to wear yoga pants or something with a flexible waist. You know, again, this is this is what I live in, yoga pants, you know. Even though I don't get an I don't get an icy belly. I mean, I don't think I've had an icy belly for a decade, but you know, because my bladder's my the my bladder is healed from the damage that it was what that happened to it, and I'm a pelvic floor patient now. Sylvia says, I was told IC and hunters are considered two separate diseases. Again, in Europe. They are separate. In America, uh, they keep them lumped together. Um, uh, the concern being that if they start using the term bladder pain syndrome, that will invalidate uh, insurance coverage and social security disability coverage. And so in America, uh, rather than splitting the two, our leaders have decided to call it IC slash BPS. I don't know how long that's going to last. Uh, technically, I think Hunter's lesion should be called Hunter's lesion disease. Um, but that's up for, that's for, for people with a higher pay grade than my myself. Those are nomenclature. We call them nomen, nomenclature discussions. And there have been many in the last 20 years. Lori says, I had a cystoscopy with hydrodistension on August 16th, and I still don't feel like I've healed. Well, I mean, it's it hasn't even been a month, girl. Come on, three weeks. Uh, it sounds like you might have had a high pressure, long duration hydrodistension, which is probably a little bit more traumatic. Uh, you know, the AUA wants people to do a low pressure, short duration. So the fact that three weeks out, you're still feeling symptoms means that your bladder was probably a bit more traumatized. But the point here is that you're feeling better slowly, which means that something is healing, right? Guys, if you ever have a hydrodistension and like four to five days later, you feel much, much worse, you always go back to the doctor because it's very common for, for people having hydrodistension with cystoscopy to develop post-op bacterial infections. We call them nosocomial hospital acquired infections. But Lori, if you're on a steady improvement, steady state of you're just feeling better over and over, that means that you're healing. Hopefully. Crossing the fingers, my friends. Ravonda says, asking about calcium supplements at OK, calcium citrate, calcium carbonate. I mean, huh, there's been a lot of discussions about calcium supplements. It's really trial and error what works for you. I take a calcium citrate myself. Some people prefer calcium carbonate. I mean, I don't have a, a general recommendation or a, a reference point that I can turn you to, a research study that I can turn you to. Um, it's really kind of just trial and error, my friend. Susan says, physical therapists are so limited in my area. I've been trying to get in to see another one when I can get there. I really don't want to go back to work after. <laughs> she says, drink water. 
by the way, I got an email from somebody who has green urine, dark green urine for months. And that's either, um, uh, he's taking a medication that could be causing that, that color change, or he's got some sort of chronic infection. It's, that's really unusual to have green urine. Sylvia says, have you ever, anything new to help hunters from, uh, aside from fulgurating them? Yes, a steroid injection, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And I did an article on that. Here it is. This is in our summer magazine. So for any of you out there, if you're a member of the IC network for $25 a year, you can get this by email. Uh, and these are much more comprehensive uh, articles on all topics related to IC. I did an article on hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, based upon a new research study uh, that came out that showed that patients with Hunter's lesions did remarkably well. Um, and here's the study. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is the same therapy that they use for scuba, dri scuba divers who come up, who surface too quickly and they get decompression sickness. And it basically forces massive levels of oxygen into your bloodstream and into various organs. And um, in this case, uh, it started with researchers in Germany and then researchers in Japan shared their experience, and then researchers in Italy shared their experience with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then the Americans at Beaumont Health conducted their first formal study with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, NIC. Beaumont Health, Beaumont Urology in Royal Oak, Michigan, it's the top IC research center in the country, in my opinion. Um, so they did the first formal American study based upon previous studies. They sought to determine if hyperbaric oxygen therapy would be more successful with lesion patients and less effective with patients without lesions. Eight patients completed the study, six with lesions, two without. 83% of patients with lesions improved with 66% showing long-term success at six months. Um, two patients had their lesions heal at the six-month check-in. The lesions were gone. Uh, only one non-lesion patient improved, uh, but that is a small study and they urge more research studies. Um, and um, you know, it comes with risks. I mean, obviously it comes every therapy comes with risks. It's so very important to understand the side effects. Oxygen is extremely flammable. And so, you know, anytime you're in an area of high oxygen, oxygenation, there's no matches, nothing sparks, anything like that. You're going to be very, very careful with metal. You will be asked to remove all metal products. It could spark. Um, and as well as some ear injuries from the pressure because you're put in a decompression chamber. And they used to be like tubes that you would lay in, but now they're actually rooms where you sit, sit in comfortable chairs. Um so uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is slow to arrive in the U.S., but it's now available at specialty centers across, across our country. The challenge, of course, is determining if your urologist is familiar with the technology and willing to try it. Uh, as we continue to see across the United States, most urologists are unable to attend national conferences or often unaware of new resources. Many are still unaware of the AUA guidelines for IC, despite the fact they were to released in 2011. So bring this article with you and teach them. You get to teach them. And then the other issue, of course, is insurance coverage. Will your insurance company pay for it? I was working with another patient last week or the week before who I think it had gone through 10 treatments and he really liked it. Um, don't, blame the, don't blame the clinician, educate them. Bring the article, ask them to do their own research. At this time, more than 192 clinical trials around the world te are testing hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a therapy for various conditions. Oh my God, there's a typo in my article. Not a typo, but that's a bad sentence. 37 studies are currently recruiting patients who struggle with radiation injury, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, post-concussion syndrome, stroke, dementia, amputation, UTI, IC, and others. Currently, the UC, UC San Diego is recruiting patients to participate in an ICHOT study. 
and there may be more. So again, if you want that article, you need to become a member and you will be able to, to download it from our website, all right? That's how we pay for these meetings, my friends. We still have bills to pay. Gina says, how do you, how to explain the cracks in the lining of the bladder? So Gina, um, uh, that's such a really, really good question. And that is addressed in the AUA guidelines. For some people, um, rather than having a circular ulcer, they have what be, what is a longitudinal crack. Also, 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 um, the bladder can fold. The bladder wall can have folds in it, which is interesting. I've got, this is my favorite picture of the year. This is totally my favorite picture of the year for IC. And the, and the reason why I like it is it shows the bladder wall. And so this is what a normal bladder wall looks like, hexagon cells. And then these little white, I mean, these little circles these are actually white blood cells attacking infection. So this is your human defenses. Isn't that cool? So look at, so, so they're fighting bacteria here. They're fighting bacteria here. There's a little bit here. And look here, you can see that the epithelial cell has been destroyed. And so now you've got uh, white blood cells actually going into the hole left behind. And see, look, look at right here. See, look at all these white blood cells. This is such the perfect picture of a bladder infection, but it's also a per perfect picture also of kind of a fold, a fold in the bladder wall. See this? I can't really see, see it goes like this. So that's kind of one of the kind of the natural ridges or whatever. I, I well, I don't know. And, and uh, you know, they, somebody might have a different explanation for that. But isn't that freaking cool? And that's the thing you really got to understand is that the human body is wired for self-defense. It is wired to heal injuries. It is wired to fight infections. If you fell and skinned your knee, you'd have a scab on it tomorrow. Healing never stops. Healing stops when you die. And not only does skin repair, and is there tissue repair happening? You've got this fabulous army of lymphocytes, white blood cells, that are sent to areas where they're infection and their job is to kill the infection. And I've never seen a better picture than this picture. I am enthralled by this picture. And the, the, the fact that here, look, you've got a, a, a missing cell and you've got the white blood cells going into this hole where clearly there are bacteria and go and it's just it's just trying to fight whatever it can. So so again, healthy tissue right here, hexagon, flat hexagon. And and then we've got this. Another thing, this is also, I mean, I I now I'm not gonna say that this is a perfect example, but there's a condition called trigonitis. Because you've got the tri uh, the trigone in your bladder is a kind of a tri triangular area in your bladder you've got your ureters and then it, it kind of goes down to your urethra and your trigone is the most estrogen dependent part of the tissue. And in some people, the trigone is flat and in other people, the trigone is bumpy. So in the old days, they thought the bumpiness, and you can see that this is kind of bumpy. It's not flat like this. I mean, there's bumpiness here. Um, in the kind of in the old days, doctors would, um, uh, basically strip off those bad cells, hoping that a new flat cells would, would land there. But now there's considerable, considerable opinion that a bumpy trigone can, can actually be normal. It's just a normal presentation of those tissues. So there's just lots of debate happening, but here's the title. Why initial UTIs increase susceptibility to further infection by the Washington University School of Medicine, the clinic of a doctor, uh, Scott Holtgren, who's a specialist in uh, E. coli infections. 
I've been to a couple of his lectures. He's brilliant. Geek. Lori says, I've done pelvic floor therapy for a year and it was so painful it wasn't working for me. So, so, so Lori, number one, remember, I, I, I think one of the points that I personally kind of went through with my physical therapist was, you know, why we were not successfully stopping this pain in my left butt cheek when we all thought it was uh, a tar a scar torn piriformis muscle and because i remember playing tennis when i was on my playing on my university tennis team i remember the first time i felt that pain and i remember having to bend over and stretch with that pain and um so I was operating on the assumption that it was just a muscle injury trauma, but it wasn't working, you know, and over the last 10 years, it's gotten consistently worse and worse and worse. And so I finally went to a sports, uh, you know, a professional athletic trainer who's worked with other athletes and had him look at me and he goes, he goes, Jill, you have SI fun dysfunction. And, and he could see it. He could see how I was walking. I was walking to the left. I wasn't walking straight. I was, I was doing this, you know, like little outward movements to the left. And, um, and when he looked more closely at it, he said, you have classic SI dysfunction. Um, and so, so it was like, that's why you're not getting better is you have a bony structure that's wrong and it's putting stress on those muscles. And for me, it was my SI joint. So now we're focusing on trying to fix the SI joint. Uh, one thing that I was doing, which was a terrible mistake, is for 10 years I've been stretching like mad on the left side thinking that it was a muscle issue. And when he saw what I was doing, because I'm super flexible now and I can touch my nose to the ground when I'm, when I'm stretching on the ground, he goes, oh, my God, stop. I'm like, why? He goes, you, you're, you've overstretched everything. You're part of the problem. You have overstretched your muscles so much that they literally cannot support your SI joint properly. So Lori, what I would say to you, or still, whoever that was, what I would say to you is for Lori, ask about bony structures. Is there anything off with a hip, with your tailbone, with your sacrum? And the other thing I would really wanna know is, is was there a specific movement that was triggering that pain? Were they being too aggressive, stuff like that? So again, anytime you have pelvic pain, we look at bony structures, we look at organs, we look at muscles, and we look at nerves. Lori says, I also had Crohn's disease, IBS, and fibro. Well, and so the fibro is, fibro is gonna uh, trigger more muscle pain anyway. Um, Krista says, anybody flare with antidepressants? Um, hmm, boy, that's a great question. I'd be anxious. What do you guys, anybody flare with an antidepressant? Uh, I hated them myself. I just couldn't tolerate them. I mean, they gave me a rapid heart rate, but I, I didn't flare. I didn't have a bladder flare from them. Ravonda says, NSAIDs caused me to flare. That's what Ray Rackley was talking about was NSAIDs. Um, Sylvia says she lives in Atlanta. So Sylvia, Dr. Denise Pecht, P-E-C-H-T, check her out. She was pretty good. I had a really lovely conversation with her on the phone. Sylvia says, how can you treat the ulcers if they come right back? I've had 30 cystohydros fulguration, but they come back in two weeks. Well, you know, I mean, honestly, Sylvia, you, I think, would be an excellent candidate for a next generation urine test um, and also for a next generation viral test. Because I, with them coming back so consistently over and over and over again, I would really want to know what the 
what the landscape is, I mean, the bacterial and viral and fungal landscape is in, in your bladder. Um, again, because we have solid research from Europe finding viral infections in the urine of patients with lesions. So I wonder if you've got, you know, an untreated viral infection um, that might be triggering this for you. I've got the research on our website about the viral infections. Um, we've been ta we've talked about it ever since they've come out. And last year at AUA, the new Epstein Barr research with Hunter's lesions came out. You can you can dig those all out in our magazines and stuff. Um, I mean, I, 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 the fact that they come back in two weeks is is really, to me, relevant. It tells me that there's some, some sort of very persistent chronic process with that. Now we got to figure out what it is. Could it be a viral infection or maybe could it be a, maybe could it be a chronic a bacterial infection? So maybe next generation, I mean, it would at least give you some data points to talk with your doctor about. If you go to bladderhealth.org, you can learn more about that. I've been working with that company for over a year now, and they were very nice to um, get uh, create a low a low price for testing. It's one hundred and ninety nine dollars. So I think that I think that would be my next step if I were in your situation. But talk to your doctor about it. Lori says she was on amitriptyline for a couple of years ago, never gained a pound. Good for you, hon. I gained 20. I gained 20 pounds in like a month. You, now, you guys keep asking me to talk about hunters. So I've, I've, I've said about all I can say on hunters. Uh, we, Sylvia, we have a whole section on our website on hunters treatments with videos. Susan says, I have suspected that NSAIDs have contributed to bladder issues in IC. I took them for years when dealing with endo stage four. After hysterectomy, I did not need them as much, but found a possible issue with my bladder when I took them. So Susan, you would support, you know, that's not surprising. Sylvia, what do I think of a urologist doing a cystohydro every two weeks? I, I, I don't know any urologist who would actually do that. Um, because uh, you're running the risk of uh, complications from the, uh, at a minimum, from the anesthesia. Um, and, and so um, I don't believe that, I don't know any doctor who would do them every two weeks. I think that would be considered too risky. I think it'd be more interesting maybe to uh, you know, maybe uh, talk to your doctor about throwing in some hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the meantime and seeing if that might be helpful. Jennifer says she went to a pain management doctor. He said he would not prescribe pain meds for IC, but he would perform a hypogastric plexus pain block. All right, worth a shot. Worth a shot. Um, I, you know, I, but I would bring him the American Urology Association guidelines for IC, which absolutely support the use of pain medicine. They want pain treated compassionately, assessed at every appointment, and they are not opposed to uh, treating with opiates, not at all. But they also don't support just taking opiates. They want a multimodal approach to pain care. They want you working with your muscles, doing everything else you can do. Um, and ultimately, in the end, trying to fix, trying to figure out what's triggering the pain in the first place, so that you're not experiencing the the high levels of pain, like an untreated Hunter's lesion. Sylvia said, "Is there anything available for Hunter's patients that have done all the lines of treatments?" Yeah, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The other thing we have is Lyris, L-I-R-I-S, the first treatment in history to heal Hunter's lesions. Um, it was shelved by Allergan uh, uh, last year, uh, but that's something else that's possible. You really need to get to a national specialist. Local doctors are not going to be up on this. It's going to be the national specialists are going to get better. So Sylvia, if there's any chance 
of you going and seeing Robert Evans at Wake Forest, Robert Moldwin up at up on Long Island, Ken Peters at Beaumont, Phil Hanno at Stanford, Chris Payne in San Jose, um, going and seeing a, a national doctor about advanced care for your Hunter's lesions. That would be important. Krista says, what about biofilms and IC being actually an invisible infection? Krista, we have taught, we taught, spent about an hour talking about that earlier, um, especially when we were going through subtypes. We certainly, I do not support, and I don't know any IC specialist who would support the statement that 90% of patients uh, have invisible infection or chronic infection simply because we know that many, many patients develop IC after muscle injuries. So we're subtyping now, we subtype. So subtype one, Hunter's lesions, that could be a viral infection. Subtype two, bladder wall driven, can be any, anything from chemo-induced cystitis, from chemotherapy, to the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, to chronic infection, both bacterial and fungal. But then we go to subtype three, pelvic floor, which is the bigger subtype. Many, many patients have muscle injuries not bladder injuries. And when we look at their bladders, their bladders are normal, like mine. My bladder is perfectly healthy and normal. My problem is muscle driven. Lori says, could weight gain be from the cystoscopy hydrodistension surgery? Uh, uh, only if from maybe from medicine that might have triggered that for you. I mean, uh, not usually we wouldn't expect that. But now you've just had a major procedure on your bladder. The odds are you've got some inflammation. So you might be having a bit of the IC belly, some swelling. I mean, I had, I had abdominal swelling for my hysterectomy mm, almost for a year. You know, I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm finally getting flat again and it's been two years. So anytime you sustain a major trauma, the area is, the area will swell on um, and heat will also make an area as well as my physical therapist reported. Susan says, I suspect hyperbaric oxygen therapy could really help those of us with bladder wall driven issues as well as, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely worth shopping. Uh, Linda says, do you prefer bladder ease or bladder builder? I also take Elmeron and aloe vera. Well, so, so Linda, hopefully you know about the Elmeron eye issue. The Elmeron has now been linked to something called pigmentary maculopathy. So if you, if you, it's very, very important as an Elmeron patient that if you notice any changes in vision, fuzzy vision, difficulty seeing in low light, you need to get your eyes checked because it's affecting uh, quite a few people, at least in our study, it sh it's affecting quite a few people. Our informal survey of more than a thousand patients using Elmeron, 53% report uh, some sort of retinal problem. So it's pretty big in our ours, but that's very informal. Um, so the question is what supplement? Um, uh, uh, I, we do not support bladder ease because bladder ease has one ingredient in it that can be irritating to the bladder. And I believe that it is uh, bioflavonoids derived from citrus. So bladder ease is not recommended. Um, what we do have is, and I've got them here. So these are the top four supplements that at this point in time are being used by IC patients. We have bladder builder. Bladder Builder is, is truly a next generation formula because it, it does more than just work on the bladder. It's got probiotics in it for the gut. It's got PEA in it for pain relief. It's got collagen in it for the bladder wall. So Bladder Builder right now is kind of the mo most robust formula. Then we have Bladder Rest. And bladder Rest is our option for Sister Protect for people who are taking Sister Protect. This is since Sister Protect now has a cancer warning. Uh, where people are transitioning over to Bladder Rest. It's almost the same formula, except we took out the glucosamine, put in a couple of amino acids. When I say we, it was uh, the company that made uh, Bladder Builder heard about Sister Protect, and I was bemoaning my fate <laughs> and having to talk about that with people. And they said, hey, we have all these ingredients in our warehouse. We can create an alternative. 
because I knew people with IC patients would be panicking. And so they created bladder rest. And as, as they looked at the formula, you know, they were consulting with me and another uh, IC doctor. And so we made it different by just taking out the glucosamine and putting in some amino acid. Then we've got Piora. Piora is uh, a palmitoethanolamide combined with resveratrol. Uh, PE, also known as PEA. In Europe, PEA has been used for chronic pain for many, many years. There are many, many research be studies behind the use of PEA uh, for uh, sciatica, for neuropathic pain, for burning mouth syndrome. And we have our first study with IC that was presented uh, at, in May um, at the AUA conference. Uh, the Italians combined the PEA and the resveratrol. And in their study, at three months, 50, uh, 87% of, of patients had a significant reduction in their pain. At six months, every single patient in their small study had 100% response to the pain and 25% were pain-free with this PEA resveratrol. And given that so many patients are being thrown off of their opiate medications, having something which might help with pain is important. So Piora is the American version of that European formula. Uh, it's slightly different, but the, the intent was to try to get the same method of action. It's actually a stronger formula. And so Piora has been out now for about three months and quite a few patients are using it. Um, it's $29 um, and you can, but it doesn't have any bladder coatings in it. It's just about pain relief. And then last but not least, we have Sister Renew. And Sister Renew is um, kind of like Sister Protect, but with aloe in it. Um, and so some patients have converted to Sister Renew, but if you're aloe intolerant, you cannot do that. So those are the options right now. Um, people are going to say, well, what would you do? And my answer comes back, my answer comes back to how sensitive you are. If you're aloe sensitive, Sister Renew and Desert Harvest Aloe is out. So um, that leaves Bladder Rest, Bladder Builder, and Pura. If you flare, if you flare with probiotics, and I do not understand why some patients flare with probiotics, but some of you do, then you cannot do the bladder builder, you would do the bladder rest. But if you're pretty robust and you can tolerate a lot of stuff, then I then I would start with the I would try the bladder builder. Of course, there's no way anybody can tell you if it's something's gonna work for you. It's just trial and error. But at least we have options now that. IC therapies have been so, you know, badly compromised by side effects. So again, Elmeron linked to eye issues. And now, as of a month ago, we now know that amitriptyline, uh, as well as, so the antidepressants, as well as the antispasmodics, the oxybutin and sedetrols have now been linked to dementia. So it's like, what the hell should a patient do? And I emailed my medical board and I said, okay, guys, we're at the situation where a lot of the stuff that patients relied on are now kind of sketchy and scary for these patients because of side effects. So what should they do? And Robert Evans said, that's why he's moving to more bladder installations because you don't get the systemic effects and patients can do them at home. And we know a rescue installation can reduce your pain. Unfortunately, Heparin is now on short supply. So getting the supplies for bladder installations is getting much harder. So again, we're in this really dicey position right now. So all I can say is they, at least we've got something that might help that it might be worth trying. No guarantees. It's just trial and error. Uh, Sylvia said something about interstem. Wonder if you can do this with interstem. I don't know what you mean. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy with Interstand, probably, I would doubt it. I don't know. I mean, could you do hyperbaric oxygen therapy if you have a pacemaker? I don't know. You would have to ask that. You'd have to ask the the uh, the companies to do that. Lori says, "I have an Interstand implantation. I wish I'd never had it done. Doesn't help, but they won't take it out." Um, that's the ultimately. That's the that's a real sad thing about. Uh, having a medical device put in your body, if it 
So basically the insurance company's position is, is that if it's not malfunctioning, if it's not impacting your quality of life, they're not going to pay to have it removed. And the problem with that is the longer med the longer that inner stem is in your body, the more scar tissue is going to grow over that implant make it, and the leads in that implant make it harder to remove. But what I've heard from patients in your situation, Lori, is that they have been told that the device has to be malfunctioning for them to pay for it to be removed, like you getting shocked. It's crim I, I you know, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of tempted to say it's criminal. It's really sad. You know, um, you're kind of in a, a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. And the same thing, we have the same thing with the um, antidepressants that have now been linked to, uh, or the bladder antimuscarinics, the detrol sidotropans have now been linked to dementia. And so we have another medication called Mirbitrick or Mirabigron, which can help you with frequency urgency, but unfortunately it's much more expensive and insurance companies will not pay for it. Insurance companies would rather that you take a medication that can give you dementia than take a more expensive medication that won't give you dementia. And that is the ultimate conundrum here. And it's a, a terrible tragedy. Megan, best treatment for Hunter's, Hunter's ulcers. Megan, we've been talking about that a lot tonight. Um, there's no best treatment. It's about what works for you, but triamcinolone injection in the center of the lesion uh, has a few side effects. Uh, we, cauterization can leave some scar tissue behind, but sometimes you have to do that. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. <clears throat> Last year, the best treatment was Lyris, L-I-R-I-S, but the company has shelved it and deprioritized it. Alrighty then. I don't even know how long we've gone. Oh, three hours and six minutes. Brenda, have you ever had or heard of anyone having a lot of pressure at the end of voiding? I mean, almost like when you get birth. Yeah, hon, you're having a bladder spasm. You're, ha you're having a bladder spasm. That's usually the way a bladder spasm would present is right at the end of voiding with that tight pressure. And you say, hey, I almost feel like you give birth, that feeling of pushing and you can't stop. I just have to wait for the feeling to subside. You are describing a bladder spasm perfectly. And so you, you are hunched over on your toilet for five minutes until it starts to release. So talk to your doctor about an antispasmodic, a smooth muscle antispasmodic, a bladder muscarinic used short term, doesn't come with the risk. It's just long term use. I found for me that, that when I was having bladder spasms, Ditropan turned them off in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Um, the challenge is, is if you take Ditropan every day over time, it kind of deadens the nerves that help you control your ability to urinate. And so at about the three month time for me, I, I just couldn't pee easily because of the medication. So I stopped using it which was fine for me. Um, and then I only had it if I had bladder spasms and I've only had bladder spasms once in my life. And that was for about a week when I had a really bad bladder infection, but hon, you're, you, you're describing a, a bladder spasm well. So tell your doctor that you think it's a bladder spasm and, and ask if uh, medication might help. Lisa says, what's the best way of, of getting out of bladder pain with subtype two? A rescue install. Lisa, have you had a rescue installation with heparin lidocaine? That would that would turn turn it off. Desert Harvest is sponsoring with Dr. Robert Evans on YouTube on Thursday. Awesome. Really? Okay. Hey, where where the heck are the details on that? Seriously, people, seriously, if you have a chance to hear Dr. Robert Evans who is the, has been voted the IC doctor of the year for the last five plus years, do it. And if, uh, if a desert harvest is sponsoring it, go for it. I don't see anything about it on their website. I wonder if it's on their Facebook page. 
Let's see. I mean, seriously, world's best coming onto Facebook. What a rare opportunity. We did uh, a lot of lectures on our uh, free lectures on our website for years, including the first online IC conference, which we did in 2006. And I had like 15 speakers in that. And we want to do it again. It's just finding the freaking time to do it all. Okay, so Thursday, September 12th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4, 4 p.m. Pacific Time on the Desert Harvest website. Go for it. Just go for it. Now, you just got to remember, now listen, doctors have different opinions. Um, so he may, he may say things that, dis that disagree. He might not like the pain subtyping system. He might like it. I don't, I mean, I don't have the opportunity to talk to him very much. We, we, we share email several times a year. Um, but all those top doctors have, have kind of similarities and differences. Any opportunity you have to hear someone of that caliber talking about IC, I say you go for it. And I hope somebody who's there, I hope you will ask him about what he thinks of the theory that IC could be chronic embedded infection. I'm, I, I would love to get a top IC doctor's comment on that. I've, we've talked about that today. I don't believe, I, I think a small group of patients could have a, a, a embedded infection, but certainly not everybody. But if this is an opportunity for you to ask questions, I will, I'm going to email Desert Harvest and probably send him a couple of questions too. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to go. I mean, I adore that man. We, we probably disagree on a few things, but that's okay. I adore him. His, his, his devotion to the IC patient community through his, his entire career is nothing short of astonishing. And we all owe him a debt of gratitude for everything that he's done for us. Ravonda, when does the IC Optimist yearly membership end? Does it automatically renew? Yes, you get an email 30 days ahead of time from us saying that it's due and you have an option to opt in or opt out. Uh, uh, opt out. And so if you email us back and say, hey, I'd rather not do it, we'll, we will cancel it. If we don't hear from you, we will renew it. Susie says, is the Beaumont study and biomarkers still going on? I don't know. I don't know. Probably. Uh, Shannon asked, does bladder builder help with pain? Yes, bladder builder does have PEA in it, which has been found to reduce pain in many, many different studies on many pain conditions. So, so bladder builder is the only supplement that does, bladder supplement that does have PEA in it. Shannon says, what do I think about marshmallow root? Marshmallow root it actually, about 50% of the patients love it, and about 50% of the patients report flares, and that's we've known that for 20 plus years. So um, I'm not all in on marshmallow root, um, but for some people it's helpful, for some people it's hurtful. You just got to try it. Megan says, I want to quickly say thank you for doing this Facebook Live. You've given so much good information, it gives me faith that there are medical professionals that care. We try. I love my job. I'm not a doctor, though. I'm, a, I'm the national IC support group leader. Uh, I'm the longest serving support group leader in the nation. And I'm the only one doing national and international support group meetings through these streams. The more, the merrier. Hey, you know, guys, uh, for IC Awareness Month, we're celebrating support group leaders because there aren't too many of us anymore. Um, and over on the icawareness.org, which is our I see Awareness Month website, icawareness.org. Please go over there and participate and do a, you know, make some posters and some memes and send out a press release. There's lots of things you can do. Uh, but we also list support groups, the, all the support groups that we know of, both online and in person. 
And so you can find support groups there, but we would love it if you started a support group. You know, guys, I started as a support group leader. Yeah, man, I just wanted to have a support group leader in Sonoma County, support, support group in Sonoma County, California. Within six months, I was a Northern California IC support group leader with 300 people in my group. It was crazy. You know, there is a need. I, I'm just going to, and we, and I have a guide on how to run a support group. I mean, I'm just going to say this. When you're a support group leader, um, you have to put your personal stuff aside as much as you can. And that's the gift of being a support group leader. By helping somebody else, you step away from your own issues. And there's great benefit in that. That's really good for the self-esteem. But you also got to know your stuff. It's very important that you not bring biases into your groups, which is hard. And it's something that's always going through my brain. The worst thing I could do as a support group leader is to, is turn you away from the one therapy that might have helped you. That's my greatest fear, and it's been my greatest fear for 25 years. And that's why I try to talk about everything and give you pros and cons and then kick you in the butt and get you back to your doctor to talk about it. And so you got to be pretty neutral as a support group leader, and you've got to be informed. Uh, you got you to do your research. And if you're using your support group as a platform to you know, to support a point of view, I think you're doing a disservice to your patients because not everybody's going to fit that point of view. I also think starting IC support groups is not, is, is a mistake. You should start a pelvic pain support group um, so that you can pull all the pelvic pain patients in together. That's what I would do differently now. So Susan says, uh, I think that mar she's referring to marshmallow root caused increased frequency of urination. Yeah. Michelle says, I'm getting weekly bladder and stills with a cocktail of DMSO, a steroid, and an anti-inflammatory. Just not sure what they are. You keep saying heparin lidocaine. I wonder if they're using these. Ask them. You know, there are two core fundamental bladder instills. Uh, DMSO, a DMSO cocktail, which is what you're getting which is DMSO combined with a steroid and an anti-inflammatory. And sometimes they throw in lidocaine in there. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they throw an antibacterial, an antibiotic in there. Sometimes they don't. So that's a DMSO cocktail. But the more popular cocktail by far is a heparin cocktail, a heparin lidocaine cocktail known as a rescue installation. And it's called a rescue for a reason because it rescues you out of a flare. So when you have a rescue with a heparin lidocaine, most patients walk out of that appointment pain-free. And to be pain-free for a couple of hours is everything. And what we know then is, you know, it's kind of like, let me see, how do we explain it? So, so when you have a nerve that keeps firing over and over and over again, and you know, and that's the thing about bladder pain is bladder pain is very consuming. You can't really walk away from it. It dominates your thoughts. You know, I mean, if you fell and skin your knee or you have a deep cut on your arm, the odds are four or five hours later, you're, you're watching TV and not feeling it. But the thing about bladder pain, organ pain, is it's characterized by being relentless and difficult to ignore. It can be agonizing and consuming. And that is because it uses a different part of the spinal cord. It goes to a different part of the brain and it's organ pain. So how do we calm those nerves down? That's the challenge here. And how do we give the patient some relief? How do you, you know, how do you get some relief? So the theory behind a, a rescue instill is by numbing that nerve consistently over time, you're physically calming that nerve. Uh, and so um, the protocol with the original rescue installation was, I think it was, what was it? It was something like three times a week for two weeks. And then once a week for a month and then as needed. 
but some patients do rescues at home every day. And if that will reduce your pain, power to you. It's pretty easy to do a bladder and still, you just have to learn how to do it. Um, but, you know, being able to self-catheterize is a tremendously good skill to have to, for, for any IC patient. All right. Tina says, I think it's embedded infection. Tina, not for everybody because more patients have muscle injury than bladder injury, but for some patients, it can be embedded infection. I'm not disagreeing with you there. I'm just not going to make a blanket statement and say that applies to everyone. Bobby says, I've changed my diet for IC, got off all sugar, rice, potato, pasta, bread. I'm not in pain 24-7 but you're still getting a UTI every two weeks. I don't know what else to do. So Bobby, the question is, is what's the infection? You know, I mean, so you're making really good choices with respect to your diet and inflammation. So I absolutely commend you on that. You've responded to that beautifully. Um, but the reality is, is you're either having a flare every two weeks or you're having an infection every two weeks. So you too, you know, would be a, a, a very interesting candidate for next generation urine testing. You know, or you can do the Dr. James Malone Lee protocol where he doesn't believe in any testing pretty much. He thinks all testing is flawed. And instead, what he, he thinks doctors should do and look at, is look at urine under the microscope. And if you see white blood cells in that urine, his position is that is a sign of chronic embedded infection. And then he puts patients on a very specific antibiotic regimen for a long period of time, like well over a year. That's very controversial. Very few doctors in the U.S. would support long-term antibiotic use. So, you know, I mean, but it's, it's, a, it's one of the theories out there. So you now, you are in the position now where you're not getting, you're, you're getting better, but you're, you're having persistent, consistent symptoms. So what the American Urology Association would say is, okay, let's revisit the diagnosis. Let's see if we've missed anything. And I think the first step, if I were in your shoes, the first step really would be maybe a next generation urine test or more aggressive urine testing to see, to see if they can identify that. And now, Bobby, if you go to my Twitter page, and I talked about this earlier, I just shared a fascinating article. Let me get it again. So it's a story of a woman who had an infection for over 40 years. And hold on, let me let me find it. So this was in the Atlantic magazine like last last week or this week. Um, and so Nanelle Mann began getting UTI infections in 71 when she got a hysterectomy following the birth of her sixth child. She would take antibiotics and get better, get sick again, take antibiotics, not get better, take other antibiotics, repeat, repeat, repeat for more than 40 years. The list of treatments that worked against her infections got shorter and shorter and shorter over time, and her UTIs became resistant to multiple antibiotics. So she was very lucky that she ended up getting in touch with a microbiologist at the University of Utah who decided to follow her very closely and use her as um, an opportunity to try to study these infections. And what they found, here, hold on. Okay, so what they found was every time she had an infection, it was a very specific E. coli known as ST131 which is commonly found in drug-resistant UTIs. Every time this happened, it was the same infection over and over and over again. And so that led the researchers and the doctor to say, is there a source of it somewhere else in her body that is seeding her bladder, that is, that is influencing and infecting her bladder over and over? And they found it. They found it in her bowel. They found it in her gut gut. And what they found when they did next generation testing in her bowel is the same strain of drug resistant E. coli. So 
Now, so in their opinion, they think that recurring UTIs are triggered by a biome dysfunction in the bowel. And so they're targeting uh, the biome in the bowel to treat the bladder infection, which is very different than what Dr. Malone Lee is doing. And so they're doing fecal transplants of good, healthy bacteria to kill the bad bacteria in the bowel. And that is definitely the trend. We're gonna be seeing much more of that, especially as antibiotic resistance is growing. So they did a small clinical trial of fecal transplants in patients with recurring UTI. Preliminary data on 10 patients found that they reduced UTIs at three months, but that it wore off at six months, su suggesting that the gut microbiome might need to be replenished regularly. So, you know, I mean, again, so, I mean, we got all these theories floating around and people are really passionate about it. So we've got Dr. Malone Lee's theory. Then we've got these guys saying recurrent UTIs are coming from the bell. Then we've got Barbara's theory about porphyria and vitamin B12 deficiency. I mean, there are so many theories out there and each one of them has merit and each one of them may be relevant when you understand and accept the fact that we are not a homogenous patient population. We are a very diverse patient population with many different presentations. I see literally as a grab bag diagnosis. If you've got frequency urgency that they can't figure out, they're gonna be, you're gonna be diagnosed with IC, despite the fact that we know fibroids can trigger IC symptoms, endometriosis can trigger IC symptoms. I mean, so, I'm against blanket statements. I don't want anybody saying everybody has embedded infection. I don't want everybody saying everybody has fibroids. I don't want everybody, to, you know, because you're, you're, you're showing your naivety about the diversity of this patient population. You go to a support group meeting, you see that diversity and it just blanket statements don't make sense when you're working with patients directly, in my opinion. For some of you, yes, but not for all of you. Michelle says, can bladder builder be taken if you have depression and anxiety? Honey, if you got depression and anxiety, you got to work with your doctor about the medications you should be taking. You need to ask them that question. Lily, what should I do to calm flare-ups to a food reaction? So if you're having a flare, because you ate or drank something you shouldn't have done, your number one goal is going to be to dilute your urine. So the first thing you do is, is drink some water to, to, to uh, dilute your urine. And number two, take a Tums or Preleaf or a little bit of quarter teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate and a glass of water to alkalinize your urine, to alkalinize that acid level. Um, if you sign up for our magazine, we at the IC Network, we have a free newsletter that you can, it comes in a little pop-up window on our website, or you can sign up for it on, on our Facebook page. Your gift for signing up for our newsletter is our 40-page flare management guide, which will give you hour-by-hour -hour rescue plans on what to do when you have a flare, when you have a food flare or when you have a uh, other flare. And so, uh, I don't have the picture of it here. If you just sign up for our newsletter, you can download it, 40 pages, all all for managing flares. In fact, I need to rewrite it. We were the first group to actually have a flare guide, just like we were the first group to create the, a big diet list. Because hello, we're IC patients, right? Lily says, heparin lidocaine rescue and still help for an hour or so. Uh, you know, but an hour without pain will let you breathe. And for some people, it's a couple of hours, three to four hours. But to just have that moment where you can breathe and you can, I mean, I remember for me, my first year with IC, because my, my bladder pain started with a chemical accident. And I, then I drank a quart of cranberry juice a day for a year, not having a clue. I was making it that much worse. And I ended up in the hospital at the ER like three days in a row. Up at Lake Tahoe. And then down here the next two days here in Santa Rosa where I live. And they... Up at, up at Tahoe, they actually, for the first time, they gave me pain medicine for the drive home. And I took it and I was stunned that, that I felt better. 
which is so silly because again, I'm a, uh, my training is in drug development, pharmacology, and it never dawned on me to use a pain med for bladder symptoms. And I don't think up to that point, I really understood that I was really in pain. Um, and um, when my pain turned off, the light bulb turned on, and then I finally got hope again. It's like, oh, wait, you can turn this off? Really? Oh, wow. Okay. Mind-blowing. So if a, if a heparin and lidocaine instill will turn your pain off for an hour or two, you can breathe. And that's a good thing. And the other thing to understand, too, is if that is what's working for you the best, they can teach you how to do it at home. I've got one very good friend with IC who is a teacher in high school. And she was doing it before she went to school as she's, and then during school. And you got to do what you got to do. Our big challenge right now is this heparin is on a shortage right now. Susan, many, many theories. Yeah. All right, my friends. All right, my friends. We've been going on for three hours and 30 minutes. It's, I love doing these. I love taking your questions. I am not perfect. I do my best. My job is to educate you and my job is to show you where the information is and then kick you in the butt and get you back to the doctor so you can have a good discussion with your doctor about your treatments. You shouldn't interpret anything that I've said here as medical advice. It's information. Now it's your job to research that information and go have a chat with your doctor about it. Alrighty, so um, I, I always end these meetings because it's six o'clock here and I'm gonna have to go fix dinner for my parents um, uh, with um, a really, really, really important, important thing. If there's one thing that I want you to remember is that none of this is your fault. You have done absolutely nothing wrong. I don't want you carrying any shame. I don't want you carrying any blame. I don't want you to assume that you're damaged goods. I don't want you to assume that you're freaking unlovable. I don't want you to say that you're a bad wife. I don't want you to say that you're a bad mother. I don't want you to say that you're a bad friend. I don't want you to say any of that because none of that is true. None of that is true. You are hurt. If your best friend was hit by a car outside in front of your house, what would you do? You would run out there. You would call 911. You would sit there. You would hold her wounds. You would care for her. You would wait for the ambulance. You would ride in the ambulance. You would go to the hospital. You would be there every day at the hospital. And then when she is discharged, you would go to her house and you would do everything you could for her until she was better. That's what you deserve. You are hurt. You are working your ass off to get better right now. And I don't want you to do it alone. I don't want you to hide it. If you need help, ask for it. It's so odd to me that Men and women are taught society-wise that they're, especially moms, but dads too, that your needs are less than the needs of your family. And that is not fair. If you're in pain right now, and if you can't make dinner, or you can't do the washing, you should ask for help for those. Don't, you know, you deserve love. You deserve kindness. You deserve companionship. But we're really good at, we're really good at that negative self-talk. You know, we're really good at starting to think that we're damaged. I, I'm speaking from experience here. I'm speaking from, I mean, like I really thought when this all happened to me, because, you know, there were so many mysteries about what the hell was wrong with my body, you know, because I had the vulvodynia, then I had the irritable bowel and my 20, and you know, it was like every year it was something freaking new. 
And by the time I was like 28, 29 years old, I was like, you know, even though I was in graduate school and even though I was highly functional and doing well on the inside, I felt like I was being punished. I did. I, I like almost felt like I wasn't worthy and we became very, very depressed. And, and then the IC happened and the bladder pain happened and, and holy hell, it was like, really God, you're giving me something else. And, you know, some days just hour by hour, you know, you're just trying to get minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And that's what you've got to do to get through the time. But I want you to carry hope in your heart because I'm the perfect example of someone who thought she would never get better, who has gotten better. I'm much better. I mean, for God's sake, I've been talking for almost three and a half, more than three and a half hours. I am better. I haven't gone to the bathroom once. I am better. Healing happens. Carry hope in your heart every day. But it really begins, and, and, and remember too, remember too, don't let anxiety stop you. Don't let anxiety stop you. You have never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens in your life than you are at this very moment. Because you are truly one day older and one day wiser. The mistake you made two years ago, you're not going to make again. You've learned from it. Be strong. Be confident. Be informed. Walk into a doctor's office. Look them in the eye. They're not better than you. They're not better than you. They are humans too. I don't want you to walk into a doctor's office and burst into tears. I want you to doc go walk into a doctor's office. I don't even want you to say you've been diagnosed with IC for God's sake. I want you to focus on your symptoms. Doctor, here's the scoop. Whenever I pee, I have burning on the outside. Can you help me figure out what that is? Or doctor, whenever I bend over, I get shooting pain down my left side. Or doctor, whenever I have sex, I have a flare six hours later. Or doctor, I got something really embarrassing to talk about. Man, I got rectal pain. Can you please help me figure that out? You know, you've got to be able to talk about your stuff and just engage in a dialogue. Another thing I want you to do is, for God's sake, if you're a woman, get a mirror and look at yourself. You'd be stunned at the number of women who call this office and they've never looked at themselves. You need to know the landscape. How? Because if you all of a sudden have external pain, is it red? Do you have bumps? There's no shame in learning your body. You got to do it. Learn it. No shame, no blame. So every day you have homework. I'm going to give you five pieces of homework first. Homework. Okay. And I, well, I got to write this down because I might, I might forget this. Hold on. I got to, I'm going to, I'm adding homework here. Okay. Homework number one, 15 minutes a day, do something for your spirit. You know, do something for your spirit. I don't care what it is. You can go to church. You can listen to a lecture online. You can watch a video, whatever. You can go outside and let the sunshine bathe your face and just take a few deep breaths. Do something that will give you um, a break and comfort you. That's number one. Number two, 15 minutes for your body. I need you to do, I need you to do something for 15 minutes that you know will be good for your bladder, or your pelvis. If you got pelvic floor dysfunction, come on, you can do 15 minutes of stretches. You can do get do the things that your physical therapist told you to do, which I have not done in three days, which I have to do. Okay. I need you to do 15 minutes for your noggin up here. Because seriously, now listen. I'm proud of the fact that I can talk about IC to just about anybody. And nobody is going to tell me that IC is in my head. I will, I don't care who they are. And I'm going to tell you right now, I did a smackdown with a major pharmaceutical company. I was so proud of myself. And that is why, my friends, you are going to have Cystoprotec reformulated 
in less than two months because I went to town on those people. And they, they say, if, if you hadn't done that, we wouldn't have done it. So we are going to have reformulated Sister Protect. How cool is that? For those of you who really like Sister Protect, we will have it again. All right. Your fourth piece, piece of homework is laughter. Because here's what we know. When you're in pain, context matters. If you're laughing and in pain, your brain minimizes that pain. If you're crying and in, you're in pain, your brain is going to go, uh-oh, something's really bad, bad is happening, and it's going to intensify that pain. So I need you, here's your homework, 15 minutes, funny videos on YouTube or watching comedy. But, man, I need you to laugh your butt off. I want you to laugh tonight and tomorrow, every day. That's what I do before I go to bed. I watch videos. And, um, and then of course, please help me. I see awareness month, go to icawareness.org and read about what, what you can do and do stuff, make a poster, make a meme, send our press release to your paper. I can't do it all nor should I have to do it all. If not you, who? So 15 minutes a day for the next 20 days. Get your butt over to icawareness.org and do something. Call a radio station. Talk to, ask them about IC. You know what? Uh, go to a website. I mean, to please, 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 please. We need you. If not you, who? We need you. And again, if you make a poster or a meme, my friends, $100 gift certificate from Amazon, if you win, certainly that's worth 15 minutes of your time tonight. Make a poster or make a meme and send it to me because I would love to award you that $100 Amazon gift certificate or that $50, Amazon, $50 Amazon gift certificate. And again, like I said before, if you entered earlier, you have to know our mail server uh, uh, was having mega problems and they're trying to figure it out. And so any entries that were sent in the first nine days, I don't have. So you need to send them again. So please pass the word. I feel terrible about that, but it wasn't my fault. It was Mailgun's fault. <sighs> Ah, uh, okay. All right, my friends. I wish you the best. I hope that you sleep well tonight. I hope that you have a fantastic day tomorrow. I hope that you, I, I want you to think big. There's no, you don't need to give up on anything. Think bigger. Do you have a question about IC? Don't just sit there and suffer. For God's sake, get online. Ask a question. Be bold. Email a doctor. Email a researcher. I did it. You can too. All right, my friends. I wish you the well. And again, if you want to support us, please, you can also order mugs. There are two different designs. There's a beautiful full color design. Uh, you can order bag. Oh, oh my God. I forgot the giveaway. Holy hell. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Oh, oh my God. Okay. So this is our other design. And I got, I have a whole bunch of freebies to give away. They just haven't come yet, which is one reason why I haven't done a sporker meeting. And I would be doing, uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing another meeting probably on Friday and another meeting on Sunday. Uh, but I have a giveaway here. So I have an organic cotton bag. I see strong. Uh, and, uh, I would love to give one to somebody on Facebook and one to somebody on YouTube. Um, and so we just have to come up with the appropriate question here. So what would be a good question? Oh, cause I'm not making it easy. I'm not going to make it easy. Um, 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 okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. I'm going to do the same question that I did in the last meeting. And we'll see, we will see.
Hey, Ellen. Ellen on YouTube. Uh, Jude, I, I would love to talk to you tomorrow and give you some tips and stuff, hon. Okay. Ellen is saying it's better to hide it because so many people don't believe you. Well, you know what? I'm going to give you stuff that you can show to those people so that they will believe you. Okay. Uh, you call me. Call me when you can. Okay. So here's your freebie question. Ah, oh my God. I almost shut. Oh, oh God. I almost shut down Facebook by accident. Okay. I showed you this picture. And I pointed to these little tiny things. And I need somebody, uh, so the first person on either platform to tell me the official name of those little tiny things is going to get a free IC Awareness bag. Okay, so these little tiny things that we're fighting bacteria are called what? All right, Sarah DeMarco. Sarah DeMarco is our winner on... Uh, YouTube. So on Facebook, let's see. So Sarah, um, I'm writing your name down. Okay. My Facebook feed has kind of stopped here. I can't tell if you guys are replying or not. Hold on, I gotta I gotta make this bigger. All right, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Uh hmm. I mean it looks like the stream is still working, but I'm not seeing anybody putting anything in here. I might, I might have screwed myself, actually, accidentally. Okay, well, Facebook, I don't know what's going on with your feed. Uh, I, I'm not seeing it. Um, well, I'll give you one more shot because some of you are putting hearts in there. So I know something's working on Facebook. Does anybody remember on Facebook the name of these little things that fight infection in your body? YouTube, man, YouTube kicked your butt, Facebook. Anybody? <laughs> All right. I, I, uh, uh, All right, Facebook. I'm sorry. The second one is going to Lisa White on YouTube. Instead, because she got the answer too, the answer is leukocytes or white blood cells. Leukocytes or white blood cells is the answer to that question. Proof that the human body is wired to repair itself. Okay. All right. So for Sarah and for Lisa, although Lisa, I think I already have, I have, already have your address. Sarah, if you could email me, icnetwork at mac.com with your snail mail address. I will get that in the mail to you. Um, guys, the best way to get a hold of me is not by sending me Facebook messages. Uh, uh, email me, icnetwork at mac.com or call me. I just found a whole bunch of messages on Facebook that were like weeks and weeks old. And I just didn't even know they were there. And I feel terrible about that. But it is what it is. We're doing our best. Okay. I see strong. You are, you are, you've never been stronger than you are at this very moment. Think of yourself as being strong because you are. Okay, my friends. See you later. All right, YouTube. Right, let me just see if there was anything else here. Alan, I'm sorry that you have to do that. That just sucks. If you were if you were out here in California, there you go. All right. 
All right, YouTube. I'll see you later. Big hugs. I'll see you in a couple days.